Good morning, please be seated. Good morning. It's okay. Any preliminary issues?
right. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. <clears throat> when the state is ready, you may call your next witness. Thank you. You're under the state calls officer, Neil. Thank you. Just watch your stuff there, officer. Can you remain standing? Raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony that you're about to provide will be the truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes, I do. Okay. You can have a seat and make yourself comfortable. There's some water on it. <laughs> Officer Pensenden, can you start by uh, stating and spelling your, your name for the record? Officer Neil Pentonen, N-E-I-L-P-E-N-T-T-I-N-E-N. -E -E and Officer Pensenden, how are you presently employed? I'm employed by the Manchester Police Department. How long have you, have, how long have you worked for the Manchester Police Department? Since uh, January of 2012. And what is your current assignment? I'm currently assigned to the Community Policing Unit. And can you tell the jurors what that is? Uh, the Community Policing Unit, we deal with uh, mostly neighborhood issues, homeless issues, anything outside of the scope of patrol. Um, we kind of we will negotiate things, do community meetings, things of that nature. And and what are your current duties and responsibilities on that community policing unit? I'm uh, I am in what's referred to as an area officer. So I cover a section of the city when people call in neighborhood complaints or general issues that patrol doesn't have time to deal with. We go deal with those things. You mentioned starting with the Manchester Police Department in 2012. Yes. What did you do for work prior to that? Prior to that, I was a police officer with the Scottsdale, Arizona Police Department. Uh, I was hired there in April of 2005. And when you, when you came from Scottsdale to New Hampshire, did you go through the police academy? Uh, I took, the, I originally with Scottsdale, I attended the Mesa, Arizona Police Academy when I was hired in 2005. And when I was hired by the Manchester Police Department, uh, I attended the New Hampshire, New Hampshire uh, State Academy, uh, only the law package because I was already a certified officer. Do you remember what year you, did you graduate? Uh, New Hampshire, it was 2012. And, and sorry, I asked two questions there. Um, did you graduate from the Police Standards and Training Academy? In New Hampshire? Or, New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, it was just the law package. And in Arizona, you, you did you graduate from the police centers? I did. I graduated the Mesa, Arizona Police Academy in 2005. So in total, you have 19 years of law enforcement experience? Uh, correct. I want to switch gears, Officer Pentonen. Um, in your current assignment with the Manchester Police Department, do you have occasion to uh, conduct traffic accident investigations? Uh, occasionally, I do. And can you uh, walk the jurors through what your standard protocol is when you're responding to such an accident? Standard protocol when I respond to an accident, um, when I arrive on scene, I'll do an immediate, immediate assessment of uh, the vehicles if we need to get them off the road. I will immediately ask if anyone needs medical attention. Um, if they respond they do i'll get the fire department there or whatever medical needs if not then i will immediately ask the the drivers for their information um their driver driver's license insurance information their phone number and um as well as the as well as the registration of the vehicle uh after that i will ask who the occupants are of the vehicle and get their names dates of birth phone numbers addresses uh all for the accident report so you mentioned speaking to the drivers of the vehicles, and then you mentioned getting the, the occupant, the vehicle occupant information. Where do you usually get that information from? Uh, I will ask, I will ask whoever's there. If it's the, I will speak to each person individually and get their information. If it, unless it's a child, then I will just add, I will ask the uh, adult who's on, who's on scene with them. Do you typically speak to every individual other than children? Do you typically speak to every individual in each car? Uh, yes, I do. And what's the purpose of that? 
uh, to get a, get a brief synopsis of what occurred in the accident from, uh, from different perspectives. And do you document these investigations? Uh, I do. How do you document them? Uh, I will immediately uh, take notes on, on a notepad and then I will, uh, I will fill out an accident exchange form for the individuals involved in the accident, which will include insurance information, uh, phone numbers, addresses, and it's, which is required by, uh, by the police department. And then I will, when that is all done, I will, I will, uh, I will uh, make a, a, a traffic accident report documenting everything from the scene. And again, is it is it necessary during? And we're still talking your your standard protocol. Is it necessary during that, during these investigations, for you to see every individual involved? Uh, yes, I will need to to see who's there. And can you walk us through how that occurs? How do you see those individuals? Do you order them all out of the vehicle or something else? If they are, if they, if it's a minor accident, most of them will just stay in the vehicle. Um, if they are on scene, I will ask who is in the vehicle and take a look at each person. You do have occasions where people will show up who weren't involved in the accident, might be related. So, but I will, I will make sure that I look at each person. Officer Pentonen, I want to turn your attention to uh, November 29th of 2019. So with that in mind, were you working in your official capacity as an officer with the Manchester Police Department on yeah. November 29th of 2019? Yes, I was. And are you familiar with someone named Adam Montgomery? Uh, yes, I am. And can you tell the jurors your familiarity with him? Uh, on that day, I responded to a, uh, I was dispatched to a traffic accident at South Wilson Street in Vinton involving two, two vehicles. And uh, Mr. Montgomery, identified himself as the driver of one of the vehicles. Now, you mentioned these reports that, that you write following your investigation. Did you write a report following your interactions on that day? I did. And have you had a chance to review that before you came here to testify? Yes, I have. The accident that we're talking about from November 29th of 2019, does that accident stand out to you in your memory? It does. Why is that? Because Mr. Montgomery was involved in another accident a few days later, and in my police career, that's the only time I've had one individual in two accidents within the same week. Okay, and we'll talk about both of those accidents, but I want to focus on November 29th, and I think you said that that stands out to you. Uh, yes, it does. Can you walk the jurors through um, the initial dispatch that you received and your response to the, the scene? If uh, it was a two-vehicle accident. I um, arrived. I was in a. I was wearing. A, I was working in the patrol capacity that day. I showed up. There were two vehicles at the scene. Um, multiple individ individuals in one of the vehicles, and there was just one driver in the other vehicle. Um, I went through the standard protocol when I arrived at, at the location. And when you say multiple ve multiple individuals in one of the vehicles, <laughs> whose vehicle was that? That was Mr. Montgomery's vehicle. And were you able to identify the individuals that were in Mr. Montgomery's vehicle? Uh, I did. And who was in Mr. Montgomery's vehicle? Um, in Mr. Montgomery's vehicle, uh, I believe Kayla Montgomery identified herself as one of the rear passengers. Um, there was an individual in the um, in the front seat. I would need to need as an adult female in the front seat. I would need to look at my report to refresh my memory of her name. Do you believe that looking at your report, reviewing your report, would refresh your recollection? Of yes, it would. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes, you may. if it's been refreshed. Yeah. The, uh, the front passenger identified herself as Tabitha Scott. And Officer Pentonen, who else, if anyone, did you observe in the vehicle? Uh, there were, there were two, uh, two children in the vehicle. Did you obtain their names? Uh, I did obtain their names. And, and what were those two children's names? Uh, again, I'd have to look at my report to refresh my memory of those. Please do so. Um, you can't read from it? You can't read it out loud, but uh, feel free to refresh your recollection. Just look up when you're done. Uh, 
Uh, they were identified as Seamus Montgomery and Declan Montgomery. Did you note their relative seating locations? I did. And what, what were they? I believe it was the center, center passenger and rear right passenger. Do you know which one was in the center and which one was rear right? I don't recall which one was, was where. Is that noted in your, your It report? should be noted in my report, yes. Please, if you believe that looking at your report would refresh your recollection, please do so. Uh, Seamus was in the uh, rear middle and Declan was in the rear right. Did you see any other children in the defendant's vehicle? I did not. And did you, during your response, did you actually look inside of the defendant's vehicle? Uh, I don't recall if I looked in the vehicle or not. It was so long ago. Other than full of people, how would you describe the defendant's vehicle? Uh, the defendant's vehicle, uh, aside from having five people in there, there was clutter in the vehicle. Is that something that you saw? Uh, I did. So, officer, I want to switch gears. I want to talk about uh, that second accident just several days later. So I want to turn your attention to December 2nd of 2019. Were you working in your official capacity with the Manchester Police Department on December 2nd of 2019? Yes, I was. And on that day, did you, you respond to another accident involving the defendant? I did. And can you walk the jurors through your response, how you initially became aware and what you did after getting that uh, information? I was dispatched, uh, I believe it was on Franklin Street um, or in that general area, to a, uh, to a, a two-vehicle accident. Um, and again, the same thing, it was there were only two drivers on, on this, in this uh, accident. I immediately recognized Mr. Montgomery having, in the vehicle having dealt with him a few days prior. And again, did you follow your standard protocol after your response? I did. After you arrived at the location? I did. And uh, who, if anyone, did you document in the defendant's vehicle on that occasion? Um, I believe Mr. Montgomery was the only person in the vehicle. Do you believe that looking at your report might refresh your recollection? Oh, yes, it would. If I can have just a moment. Can I approach your honor? Yes. According to my report, Cale Montgomery was the was a passenger in the vehicle. And during that response, did you note her relative seating location? She was in the front passenger seat. On that occasion, did you look inside of the defendant's vehicle? Uh, I don't recall if I looked inside or not. Did you note anything about the defendant's vehicle? Uh, in, on this occasion, it was the same vehicle I had dealt with the week before. Um, the only thing that, that I noted about it was, was the new damage on the vehicle. And I'm sorry, I want to go back to that November 29th uh, response that you had. Around what time that day did you respond to the scene? Uh, again, I would have to look at my report to refresh my memory at the exact time. Uh, that was approximately 3.53 p.m. And how about on December 2nd? What time did you arrive on the scene? Again, I would have to look at my report to, to get the, the time that I was, that I arrived. That was approximately 10.43 a.m. If 
I can have just a moment, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you, Officer Pentonen. The defense may have some questions for you. Good morning. Morning. My name's Caroline <coughs> Smith, and I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one involves the December 2nd accident uh, that you were just talking about in 2019. And where was that accident? Uh, I would need to look at my report to get the exact address. I have it up here. Okay, go ahead. That was at Franklin and Market Street. And that's <clears throat> right around uh, the clinic at Franklin? Uh, it is in that general area, yes. Okay. And <clears throat> the one at... Um, on 1129, uh, where was that? That was South Wilson and Vinton Street. Okay. Is that near a Burger King? Um, it is not far. I believe pro approximately half mile, if I were to guess. Okay. Um, and uh, on the, I don't mean to skip back and forth, so I'll stick with the November 29. Um, you don't have a specific recollection of how you talk to people, right? Uh, not specifically, no. Whether who was inside the car, who was outside the car when you talked to him, right? Uh, no. But if people were inside the car, you probably would have walked up to the car and talked to them through the window, right? Yes, that's generally what I do. Okay. And um, you uh, saw the two boys in the back? Uh, I saw two boys there. I don't remember if they were inside the vehicle or outside of the vehicle. Okay. And... Um, <clears throat> When uh, adults are driving around with, when anybody is driving around with children in the car, you recall that you were given the ages of the children, right? Yes. And one was over a year? Uh, again, I would have to look at the, my yes. report for the... Please do. And I meant to say under a year. And to, and to note, to note what the dates are, what their birth dates are in the, as of the date. Yes, one would be on, under a year or approximately that age. And when uh, adults are driving around with a ch child under one, that child is to be in a baby seat, right? Yes. And if they're, the child is not in the baby seat, what happens? Um, generally, it's, a, it's against the law and would, would be up to the officer's discretion to write a, issue a summons for that or not. Okay. And um, the... Uh, Second child was under three? Uh, approximately. And what are the restraints to be on a child under three? Also in a car seat. Okay. And um, how about a child of five? Again, I'm five years old, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I would need to look at the exacts, but I believe it's any child under a certain size uh, also would need a car seat. At the very least, they, I think it's under 12, have to be buckled in the seatbelt? Yes. And um, so you were aware of two children, right? Uh, yes. And uh, you had no concerns about their uh, <coughs> restraints, the child seat? I, if I, I, from what I remember, I do not. I did okay. not. Uh, by the way, I did say that uh, the 12, the 1129 was outside, we said, I believe, outside uh, Vinton and Wilson. The 12-2 was outside the clinic. Correct. And the 12-2 outside the clinic was uh, 1043? Uh, approximately, yes. Okay, still morning hours. Yes. And the 1129 was in the afternoon, 3.53, 4-ish? Correct. Still light out, right? 
uh, for that time of year, yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you also s said that you gathered uh, pertinent information about the driver in the car, like the license, registration, insurance? Correct. And Mr. Montgomery had a license, right? He did. He provided me a New Hampshire license. Okay. And as far as you could tell, it was valid, right? Yes. Because otherwise there would have been a problem there too, right? Yes. I. Another thing I do is I will have dispatch do, do a driver's license status of any individuals who are operating the motor vehicles. Okay. And uh, so then on the accident on the 2nd, there were only people in the front seats of the car no one in the back seat right that's what i documented i don't i don't recall the specifics of the vehicle but that's what i documented okay and again whether you talk to the driver inside the car or outside the car you would have talked to the driver right yes and uh if the passenger was inside the car you would have walked up to the passenger side to talk to her right i would speak to him either through the driver's side or or the depending on the situation, sometimes through the driver's side, sometimes through the, the passenger side, but I will speak to them directly. Okay. And you did not see any children on that day, right? No. You didn't see any boys in the car? No. If I did, I would have documented it. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, seating on the, I'm sorry, I'm going back again when I said I wouldn't. On 1129, you specifically documented the seating? Uh, correct. And Seamus was in the middle? I believe so. So there would have been deck, uh, you can check your report. I think you documented it, right? Yes. And so Declan was on one side, Seamus on the other, and then you would have noticed Kayla or been told that Kayla was on the um, other side, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any objection to that? No. You may sit down. You're excused. Statement calls next witness. Statement call Mr. Matthew Gender into the stand. if you would remain standing for just a brief moment, please. Thank you. Would you please raise your right hand, sir? You solemnly swear that the testimony you will give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, sir. Thank you. Please feel free first to have a seat. Uh, uh, Mr. General, thank you for coming today. I wondered if you would please go ahead and state your full name and then spell both your first and your last name for the record. All right, it's Matthew Gendron. M-A-T-T-H-E-W-G-E-N-D-R-O-N. Okay. And Mr. Gendron, uh, what town are you currently living in? Manchester. How long have you lived here in Manchester? About 12 years or so. Okay. And uh, right now, are you working? Yes, sir. Uh, what type of work do you do in general? I work in a restaurant. How long have you been doing that kind of work? A lot of, most of my life, but I've been at my current job for close to five years now. Um, let me ask, at one point in 2019, did you ever work at a Dunkin' Donuts? Yes, sir. And where was that Dunkin' Donuts? It's located at Beach Street in Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, while you were there, did you ever work with somebody by the name of Adam Montgomery? Yes, sir. And with regards to Adam Montgomery, do you know who his wife is? Uh, or was? Kayla Montgomery. Okay. Did you meet her there as well? Yes, sir. Okay. And... How long did you work there with Adam Montgomery and Kayla Montgomery? Probably around a year or so. Okay. How long overall did you work at du that Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, I think I worked there two years. Okay. Did you get the job, or were you working there when Adam Montgomery started working there, or did was he working there when you got there? 
He was already employed when I got there. Okay. And what about Caleb Montgomery? Same. Same thing? All right. Um, did you ever hang out with Adam Montgomery? A few times. Okay. And did you ever uh, friend him on Facebook? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, would you send messages back and forth to each other? Yep. All right. And back in 2019, about how often would you guys talk with each other? I try to initiate a conversation every week or so. Were you uh, still working at Dunkin' Donuts when Adam Montgomery stopped working at Dunkin' Donuts? Yes. All right. show you what's been marked States Exhibit 101. Do you recognize that person? Yes, sir. And who is this? That is Adam Montgomery. That's the person that you work for? Yes, sir. One more exhibit. It's going to be marked States Exhibit 11 for identification purposes only. Okay. And I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'm just going to remove these uh, police reports here. I want to ask you just about that particular exhibit. Um, I wonder if you could go ahead and flip through all three pages just for a moment for yourself, just to orient yourself with it. images. What are these images of? Of a Facebook chat with myself and uh, Adam and Kale. And was that on your Facebook page? Correct. Um, with regards to the conversation that you have there, um, do you remember that conversation? Yes. And do you remember having looked at those images at the time that you received them? Yes. Other than the fact that they're on paper and there's a little red sticker down on the bottom of the first page, any sort of alterations or changes to those images compared to when you saw them and you first got those messages? Not to my knowledge. And are they accurate in terms of the time and date that you remember getting this message from the defendant? Yes, sir. At this point, Your Honor, I'd ask for the identification to be stricken from State's Exhibit 11 and to publish it. Any Not objection? objection. I'm sorry, you said no objection. Without. Without objection, thank you. Uh, the ID is stricken, it's entered as a full exhibit. if for some reason you need to refer to it. But I'd like to draw your attention up to the screen and have us, have you, excuse me, walk us through this exhibit together so we can understand this message that you got um, as you testified from uh, the defendant in his Facebook page. So back in, let's go ahead to December 8th of 2019. Were you still working at Dunkin' Donuts on December 8th? Not, to, I, don't, I don't recall, maybe. Um, and well, with regards to uh, at that point in time, do you know if, well, excuse me, you said you, you're not too sure if you were at working. At the time of these messages, I was at a different restaurant. You were at a different restaurant. Yeah. Okay. So you were no longer working with the defendant at Dunkin' Correct. Donuts. All right. I'd like to go ahead and draw your attention. You can either look down or look at the screen behind you. And I want to go ahead and draw your attention to page one of Exhibit 11. 
And with regards to that, um, is this what you're seeing on the screen behind you? Can you just confirm for us that is page one of Exhibit 11? Yes. Okay. And I'd like to go ahead and ask you about the conversation itself. First of all, uh, what time did you get these messages on, uh, specifically on the, uh, on the 8th? When did they start appearing? Uh, after midnight. After midnight on the 8th? And uh, specifically, what time did you first get the very first message here? Uh, from 12.13 a.m., it says. 12.13 a.m.? Yep. Okay. Um, with regards to that uh, particular time, could you go ahead and please read that message for us, the message that you received at 12.13 a.m.? Hey, need help ASAP. Please need a jumper, jump and jumper cables ASAP. And separate from that, did you get another message right afterwards, or excuse me, shortly thereafter? Yes. And what time did you get that second message? 12.58. Okay. And what was the message that you got then? It says, I need a jump. My car died. We've been sleeping in our car, and our battery just died. Now, separate from that, did you then uh, start responding back? to this Facebook message from Mr. Montgomery? Yes. All right, and what did you write? I said, I don't have any cables. Okay. And then uh, what's the next message that you received in this conversation? This is Kayla. Will you bring me to a store to get them? I'll give you gas money. We, we will literally die tonight. Okay. And with regards to that message, at that point, um, when it says, this is Kayla, who do you believe now has the phone? I believe it was Kayla. They all, that was a joint account they had together. Okay. Um, in general, when you received messages from this account, were you able to tell who it was from, whether it was from Adam Montgomery or whether it was from Kayla? Not until they identified themselves. Okay. And what about with regards to how they wrote, the type of words that they used? Did you notice a difference? Not really. Okay. What's the response that you wrote back after that? Uh, you received that message about, we will literally die tonight. I just got home from work and have to get up early for work tomorrow. What's even open and where are you guys? Okay. So to clarify, at this point when you're writing, um, you said, I don't have cables. Was that true? Yes. Okay. So you didn't, I didn't, didn't have, have cables. cables. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and um, when you say, at, when you move on about having to get up early for work tomorrow, you asked where they were. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Why did you ask that question? I was just curious as to where they wanted me to drive all around to at that hour. Pardon me. Um, continuing on with the bottom part of page one here of the exhibit, I wondered if you could go ahead and what's the response you got to that? It's okay, Matt. I don't know what's op what it is open. I'm sorry. That IDK is, I mean, I don't know, or I, I, I don't, don't know? I don't know, yeah. Okay. Um, and what did you say back? It's not your fault. I just don't have cables. It's not so I know what's it, what's open. Okay. And so at that time of night, um, did you know what was open or not? All right. It has to be a verbal answer. Of a oh, yes no, or no, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, because the microphone's picking yeah. up and recording. Um, I wondered if you could go ahead and turn to page two now and walk us through the next part of this conversation that you're having. Um, after that you said you didn't know what was open, uh, what message did you start getting on the account? I think I think either if mobile don't have them, the only place is Amherst Walmart. So I know you need to get out early. Have a good night. Sorry. Uh, you said get out early. Is that what was written? That's what it looks like it was written. There's a lot of typos. Okay. Um, certainly, uh, would you say that the typos that you're seeing here is different from what you saw before when you got the message saying that it was from Kayla? I would assume it's from the same person still. Okay. Even though the type they didn't, was they didn't, they didn't identify they changed people, so I'm assuming it's still Kayla. Okay. And so what do you respond back when they say, I'm sorry? I, I said, it's okay. Try to have a good night. Well, let me just, oh, excuse me. That's right. Let me just try to get to it. You say, it's okay. Try to have a good night. Yep. And what's the response that you got back after that? I'm going to try. We can die in this weather. We can't write, we can just really, I don't, can't even read that. <laughs> Is it C-I-L-D? Are we C -I -L -D. reading that right? Okay. And yep. it said, hey, I'm at Colonial Village, and Kimmy said she has jumper cables. 
looking at that first line, the I'm going to try, can we, I'm sorry, I'm going to try, can we die in this weather? And then is it we, how does they spell the next word after we? Looks like C-S-N-T. Is it fair to assume that might be can't? Correct. Okay. Right, we can just, is that V-E? That's what I, that's what I got. Okay. Just V, uh, really, and the C-I-L-D. What do you think that word is? Probably to cold. Be? Really cold. Okay. And then uh, the line afterwards. Hey, I'm at Colonial Village, and Kimmy said she has jumper cables. Who's Kimmy? Do you know who Kimmy is? Kimberly Frayne. And uh, were you Facebook friends with her? Yep. And I also worked with her as well. Right. At the same location. And with regards to that, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and flip over to page three now. And, um, or excuse me, uh, if you could stay at the bottom of page two, I apologize, we didn't finish here. You said, uh, can Jimmy, yeah, I'm sorry, can Kimmy jump you? Is that correct? That's what I said, yeah. What did they respond? She don't have a car. That's why I've been messaging everyone. Okay. And just for clarity's sake, when you said she don't have her car, what was actually spelled? Was that actually spelled? Yep. She don't have G-E-R car. She don't have her car. Uh, fair to say, though, you interpreted that as her car? Correct. All right. And that's why I've been messaging everyone. If you could go to page three of that exhibit and kind of take us through how this conversation ended that day. Um, after she, they said that's, uh, she don't have her car, that's why I've been messaging everyone, uh, what was the next thing that you received, the next message? So do YIH not want to do that? What did you interpret that to mean? Probably being, do you not want to do that? Okay. And what did you write back? I don't really feel like running all over the place at this hour of the night. Did you try a 24-hour road assistance thing? What were you suggesting to them when you said 24-hour road assistance? Like thing? AAA or just one of those type of services, I guess. Have you ever used that service in the past? I didn't have it at the time, but I have used it since. Oh, that's what I meant. I'm yeah. sorry. I have used it since. And, and did you find that they do have that ability to be able to jump a car? Yeah. All right. Um, and if you could go ahead and take us through uh, the next part of your conversation here. Um, it, what did they respond after you suggested that they uh, try to find somebody who could do the jump on service? It's not our car, Matt. Our car died today. Our, I'm assuming the word f is friend, is letting us stay in his it's all good, Matt. Don't worry about it. I just don't want to freeze tonight. I've messaged everyone else. So, um, again, some of those words misspelled? Correct. And when you were just reading for us, that's, is that your interpretation of those misspellings? Yes, sir. All right. Um, what did they say after saying, we've messaged everyone else? N-O-O-B-E, I'm assuming means nobody mm -hmm. has cables or nobody has their cars. Okay. Spelled cats. Spelled cats, but interpreted as cars. Correct. Okay. Um, with regards to that, what did you say back to when they were said, nobody has cables and nobody has cats? What did you write back? I get all of that. My roadside assistants can jump a car. They have helped me before. They don't ask for proof of ownership. So when you write that back to them, what's the response that you got? Yeah, no one of us has insurance. Don't worry about it, man. And what time was that final message that day? Uh, 1.53 a.m. Frame. Let me ask, did you say, I don't know, maybe a month later in January of 2020, uh, did you have any other Facebook messages from Adam Montgomery or any other discussions with Adam Montgomery about what happened that night? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, at any point in time, uh, did you ever, um, there, was there ever a conversation with Adam Montgomery with regards to you not responding that night? Uh, also, not to my not to my memory. Not to your memory. It's been a while. Okay. If I could just have a moment, please, Your Honor.
Mr. Gendron, I have one final question for you. With regards to um, the time that you were asked to go ahead and provide a jump, and uh, you had this conversation with the defendant, um, with regards to that, at that time, did you know where he was living? I did not. And um, were you ever made aware that he was homeless at that time? That was the first time I found out. Okay. When did you find out? Well, during that message that they're living in their car, I had no idea. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gendron. I don't have any further questions for you. I believe defense counsel will have a few. Okay. I do not have questions, Judge. You may step down. Thank you. We'd ask for the witness to be excused, please, Your Honor. Yes. All right. He may be excused. State would call Mr. Aaron Sweeney to the stand, please. Please be careful of the wires as you walk through. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney, if you would go ahead and please raise your right hand. This is long be squared that the testimony you give this jury, yep. the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Please. Yes. Thank you, sir. Please feel free to have a seat. as we're being recorded here today, would you please go ahead and state your full name, spell both your first and your last name for the record. Aaron Sweeney, A-A-R-O-N-S-W-E-E-N-E-Y. Okay. And Mr. Sweeney, what, uh, what city do you currently reside in? Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. How long have you been living here? Since uh, second grade, so a long time. <laughs> long time. Okay. Um, and uh, are you currently working? Yes. And where do you work? Uh, BJ's, right here in Manchester. And uh, what shift do you work for BJ's? Third shift. Okay, so let me ask you, it's about 9.55. How long have you been up? I actually called out last night to okay. make sure I got sleep. That's why I just wanted to make sure that you did get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there any reason you need me to restate your question or any lawyer to restate a question, just let us know and we'll be glad to do it, okay? Okay. All right. Um, with regards to your work for BJ's, how long have you been working for them? Uh, almost a year. Year. And prior to that, back in 2019, uh, what sort of job did you have back then? Uh, I believe that's when I was towing. Okay. And were you towing for a company called Auto City Towing? Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to ask you about a particular tow back on December 7th of 2019 at the intersection of the Webster and Elm Street around 12.52 in the afternoon. Uh, do you remember that tow? Uh, a little bit, not fully. Okay. Well, let me ask you, when you go ahead and you tow a car, can you kind of explain to the jury what sort of procedures that you go through uh, when you're making a tow? Um, our office just calls one of the drivers and we're handed a piece of paper saying where we're going and what it's for, and then we just proceed to the location. What about when it's a vehicle that has broken down? Um, was there, is there a way that Manchester Police Department might dispatch you out for a tow? Uh, well, yeah, they call our tow company, and then our guy at the front desk dispatches us out, unless the individual themselves call for a tow. Do you end up making contact with the police department before you go through a tow? No. 
just go straight from the uh, it goes straight to our front desk, and then we're handed a piece of paper, and then we go right to the scene. When you get to a scene for a tow, what are some of the very first things that you do, just generally? Uh, just contact whatever vehicle is involved and find out what's going on and where it's going. And from there, um, when you do have to use a tow, what kind of tow truck are we talking about? Uh, oh. Flatbed. Flatbed? Ones, yeah. And could you go ahead and please explain to the jury what's the process you have to go through to put a car onto a flatbed as compared to, say, uh, putting on a car where you're just kind of putting two wheels up and the back two wheels are rolling? Uh, we just get in a good spot. We hook it up and then we pull it up. That's it, really. Okay. And what about uh, when you have to do documentation of this tow? How do you document the tow that you're doing? Uh, we have a separate tow slip like the drivers use, and we just write, like, general information on it. I'd like to go ahead and show you what's a bit marked states exhibit 3B for identification purposes only. And I'd also like to show you what is page 6 of what's been marked states exhibit 3C for identification purposes only. And just have you take a look at those two documents for a moment, please. Okay. Okay. Do you recognize them? Yes. Okay. And let's go ahead and start with states exhibit, the page 6 of states exhibit 3C. How do you recognize that? Uh, this is the tow slip that the drivers fill out. Okay. So if you did a tow, is that the slip that you would fill out? Yep. And what about States Exhibit 3B for identification purposes? What's that? This is what is typed out by the gentleman at the front desk. Uh, front desk? What? Of Auto City. Of Auto City. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's not something that you yourself fill out? No. Okay. Um, with regards to page 6 of States Exhibit 3C, on that particular one, who fills out that information? I do. And when do you fill that out? Uh, we fill out just very little bit before the tow. Once we get to the tow, we can fill out more, or if we have to, we fill it out once we get back to the lot. And by the time that you are done with that tow, when you drop the car back off at the lot, um, at that point, do you have to have the rest of that filled out? Before? Yep, so the rest of this is filled out, and then we give it back to the gentleman who types out the other one. And with regards to, other than the fact that if you look at State's Exhibit 3C, page 6, other than the fact that it's obviously not on the original paper, it's been photocopied, uh, do you notice any other sort of changes or alterations from when you would have filled that out? No. Do you recognize your initials down there? Yes. Okay. And uh, did you fill this form out? Yes. Um, at this point in time, Your Honor, if I'm going to take these back from you for just a moment, sir, um, the State is going to move page 6 of State's Exhibit 3C, we'd move for, identif excuse me, for the identification to be stricken from page 6 and to make it a child exhibit of, of 3C, make it 3C1. Any objection? To page 6, so should it, if the exhibit is more than one page, should it, should it be a separate exhibit, like 3D? May we approach? <coughs>
Correct. And I apologize, uh, Mr. Sweeney. I just want to show you that page six from States Exhibit three A, and then I'm going to show you with your, excuse me three C. I'm also going to show you States Exhibit three A for identification. Are those the same toe slips? Yes. And again, other than the fact that this one's a little bit easier to read and on it with a red sticker, um, any other sort of changes or alterations between those two? No. Okay. Thank you very much. At this point, Your Honor, State moves for the strike ID from State from States Exhibit three A. No objection. All right. The idea is stricken on 3A. It is entered as a full exhibit. Mr. Smith, what I'd like to do is to go ahead and give this to you to have right there um, and permission to publish your Any objection? No objection. Yes, you may. And Mr. Sweeney, I'm going to go ahead and have you be able to look at the that photocopy uh, up close. But I'm also going to have a projector on the screen behind you. I'd like to ask you a couple different questions about the different sections of this form okay. and the information you filled out. There we go. Um, so, uh, Mr. Sweeney, if you would just turn around just for the briefest of moments and. Is that a copy of State's Exhibit 3A that you have in front of you? Yes. Fair to say it's kind of hard to read at that size, isn't it? Is it easier on the paper? Yeah, I can read it. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to go ahead and kind of uh, go through a little bit of the information that you filled out on this form, and you could tell us a little bit more about the toe. Um, first of all, where did you go to make this toe? Uh, corner of Webster and Elm. On the corner of Webster and Elm? Yeah. Okay. And uh, when you ended up towing the car initially, uh, did you bring it straight back to the lot or did you bring it somewhere else first? I brought it over to the gas station that was on that same corner. Would that be uh, budget gas right on the corner? Yes. Okay. Why did you bring it there before bringing it back to the lot? Uh, to, so they can get some things out of their car. Uh, do you always do that? Uh, only if it's safe enough or if there is a safe enough area to do it, I will. If not, I just direct them to come back to the shop. Um, when you were there, where did you park in the gas station parking lot? Uh, just close to Elm Street, like out of the way of the pumps. All right. Um, and at that point, um, did you allow some people to get some stuff out? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, who got, who got material out of the car? Uh, I just only remember two gentlemen. Two gentlemen? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And once you've towed a car for somebody to get things out of it, uh, what do you have to do? Do they just kind of climb up the side of the truck or? Uh, no. So what I did was I extended the bed back out and I tilted it down so they can go up the ramp. Okay. And then did you see the two people do that? Get yes. things out of the car? Uh, where do they put those things? Uh, in another car. Do you remember what that other car looked like? No. And the two men that you saw do this, do you remember what they look like? No. Um, what kinds of things uh, did you see get taken out of the car do you recall i don't remember typically when uh, people clean out their car like especially on the side of the road i just stay by my truck give them space okay i periodically look over to see if they're done and once they were finished where did you bring this car uh back to our lot right. at uh, auto city so let me ask you with regards to the car itself what kind of car was it that you towed uh uh Sebring, as the slip says. Okay. And uh, let me ask, again, you filled out the slip on the day of, is that yep. correct? Um, so fair to say that the information was fresh in your mind while you were there doing this? Yes. All right. And for the different areas that you might not know right off the top of your head, uh, somebody's phone number or somebody's home address, how do you get that information? I, if the person who's driving the vehicle is there, I just ask them. Okay. Um, when you fill the slip out, where does it go once you get done with it? Uh, it goes to the gentleman at the front desk, and then he does whatever he has to do with it. And uh, let me ask, is that you, you earlier looked at State's Exhibit 3B. Is that the, you said that was a type-up version? Yeah. Is that where this information will go? Yes. All right. What are some of the information in general? Um, I'll ask you about specifics in a minute. But in general, what are some of the information that you record? Uh, just the VIN number, the make, the model. Okay. VIN number? So is that a vehicle identification number? Yes. Okay. Um, do you also record uh, things like mileage? Nope. Okay. Uh, do you record a reason to make this tell? 
Yes. And what about your own mileage in going to make a tow? Is that important to record? Uh, yeah, we've always been told, like, the mileage from the start of the tow until we get back to our lot. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is go through the different sections of the tow slip with you on States Exhibit 3A and have you explain what we're looking at and the information that you filled in that day, all right? Okay. Okay. I'd like to go ahead and start focusing on the very top section there. Uh, could you go ahead and just tell us what's the time that you made this tow? Uh, 12.52. Okay. Uh, morning or afternoon? Uh, afternoon. Okay. And who was it that had requested the tow? Uh, Manchester PD. Is that typical? Uh, yeah, it's normal. All right. What was the reason that you were towing the car? Uh, disabled vehicle. And uh, the intersection itself, could you say where that was? Uh, Webster and Elm Street. <coughs> Pardon me. Where did you bring the car to? Uh, Auto City. At, where's their tow lot? Uh, it's on Commercial Street. It's right in the same building okay. as our office. Same building as your office? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you could go through as well, the information of the owner of the car, the driver, uh, who do you get that from? Uh, the driver, if they're there. And who's the, what information did you write down in this report? Uh, Adam Montgomery. Uh, what address did he give you? Uh, 77 Guilford Street. Okay. And this information would have come from him? Uh, yes. All right. Uh, next area I'd like to ask you about is a phone number. Did you get any phone number to contact him on? Uh, no. Did you ask for one, or would you have asked for one? Uh, we usually ask for one, and if they don't give us it, then we don't expect them to come back. Don't expect them to come back. What does that mean? For their car. Okay. At that point, it's believed that the car is going to be abandoned? Is, yeah. is that the... That's what we assume. Okay. All right. Let me ask you about some of the other information. How do you, the information that you write down about the car itself, I know you said the VIN number. Can we see that on the tow form? Yes. Okay. And what about the year of the car or the make of the car? Uh, that is on there as well. Okay. And could you, again, just give us the year, uh, the make, and the model of car? Uh, 2010 Chrysler Sebring, uh, silver. Okay. Uh, was there a license plate on this car? Yes. And what license plate was there? Uh, 4368206. Was that a New Hampshire plate? Yes. All right. Um, and the color of the car, what was the color? Uh, silver. All right. I see that there was something else that was initially written and then crossed out. Yep, blue. Okay. Who would have done that cross out? Me. All right. Um, looking at some of the other information on this, uh, I believe you just read the license plate for us. Is the VIN number on there as well? Yes. All right. And could you go ahead and read the VIN number for us, please? Uh, 1C3CC5FB1AN. One three seven five zero two. All right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, the mileage that you write down. Um, is that your mileage? Uh, it says service. Uh, right where it says mileage and service time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's not the car's mileage. No. All right. <coughs> and the service times. Um, what are the two times that you put down? Uh, Twelve fifty two is when I left, and one thirty nine is when I got back. Okay. And when you say left, uh, left where? Left the lot. Left the lot. Oh, left the lot to go make the tow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then um, separate from that section, I'd like to ask about the reasons. What were the reasons that you checked off for why you were towing the car? Uh, just It was disabled and the type of truck that we have. Oh, excuse me. Um, one of the last sections I'd like to ask um, about this particular slip is in your remarks section. You wrote two things. Could you please read those for us? Uh, no registration and no phone. Okay. Um, and when you say no registration, would you have asked for a registration? Yep. Okay. And is that uh, is that a normal part of your practice when you make a tow? Yes. It's just to get the most accurate information on the vehicle itself. Okay. And about the phone number, same thing? Same thing. All right. Um, finally, um, you're the tow driver on this car, correct? Yes. All right. And did you go ahead and write down your initials on that? Yep. Okay, and what were your initials? AS. All right. Uh, if you could just go ahead and, and look at the screen behind you for a moment, uh, can you just show us, just point generally uh, where your initials are? You're right there, it says tow driver. Okay, thank you. 
Just a moment, please, Your Honor. Mr. Sweeney, I know that you stated that when you made this tow, there were two male individuals that helped get things out of the car. Let me ask you, when you were making this tow, did you see any children at all? No. None whatsoever? No. All right. Thank you. I don't have any further questions for you, Mr. Sweeney. I believe defense counsel may have a few. I do, Mr. Sweeney. My name's Caroline Smith. How are you? Doing pretty good. So the car was about 20 years old? Yeah. Okay. And when you uh, respond to that location, is Manchester PD still there? Typically, yeah. Okay. Because once a car is disabled, especially in a busy intersection, they want to make sure people are moving around pretty safe, right? Yep. And um, uh, your flatbed actually has to go a little bit into the intersection to put the car on the flatbed, right? Yeah, depending on the angle of the car. Okay. And if a car is parked straight as if going straight through a traffic light, traffic light that's the kind of thing that you would get straight in front of it to put it on the flatbed? Yep. Okay. And um, was the car unlocked? I think so. I don't remember. Okay. Do you go in to like make sure the brakes aren't on or anything like that before you tow? Nope. Okay, with a flatbed you can just lift it up? Uh, we pull it up with a tow cable. Okay, and um, you don't check to make sure the parking brake's off? Nope. Okay. Uh, fair to say that you would not, you probably were there within 20 minutes of when that car broke down? Yeah. Okay. And uh, you drove over to, so the, the two guys that came up to get stuff out of the car, was the car already on the flatbed at, at that point? Uh, yeah. And uh, they came over and asked you if they could uh, get some stuff out? Yeah. And you said, well, I got to get out of here. I'll pull over to the budget. Yeah. And then you stand aside and they go through the car and get stuff. Yep. Might be going through the front of the car. They go wherever they can get access to. Okay. And it was not locked, right? No. Didn't anybody give you the keys to the car? Uh, either they were in the ignition or they were handed to me, but I honestly don't remember. You did have the keys though? Yeah. Okay. And did you give them back for when they were going through the car, or did they give you the keys after uh, they went through the car? I don't remember. Okay. Thank you. Just briefly, Your Honor, Mr. Sweeney, you were asked a moment ago uh, in regards to how long the car had been there for maybe about 20 minutes. Do you know how long the car had been there uh, in terms, when you say that 20 minutes, uh, where does that number come from? Yeah, I just by the time we get the call and I get to the scene. Um, do you know what time Manchester would have found that car or then turned around in the time between that and sending the note over to you guys to do the tow? I have no idea. It's basically, once the, the police get to that particular scene, they just call us or they call somebody. So you know the time when you got dispatched? Yeah. Um, but not necessarily what happened? Nope. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Any follow-up? When a car is broken down at a busy intersection, you try and get out there pretty quick, right? Yeah. Because that's a dangerous situation, right? Yeah. And so um, for a dangerous situation, things happen pretty quick. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. We'd ask the witness to be excused, please. You may step down. Any objection to his being excused? May I have him on call? Yes. So you'll advise the witness. Counsel approach. Thank you, Your Honor.
Not two. State will call um, specifically Mr. Joseph Tucker to the stand. Let's be careful of the wires as you're walking through. <coughs> Mr. Tucker, if you would please uh, go ahead and take the witness stand and remain standing when you get there, sir. And Mr. Tucker, if you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Please feel free to have a seat. Mr. Tucker, as we're being recorded here today, would you please state your full name and spell both your first and last name for the record? Yes, sir. Uh, Joseph Tucker, J-O-S-E-P-H, and T-U-C-K-E-R. Okay. And Mr. Tucker, are you currently employed? I am, yes, sir. Okay, and where do you work? Uh, the Catholic Medical Center. How long have you been working for them? Uh, I just started back up in January. Okay, and uh, what do you do for them? I'm the cybersecurity manager. All right. And prior to working for a Catholic Medical Center as the cybersecurity manager, where did you work? Uh, Solution Health. Solution Help? Health. Health, okay. Yes, and what was the time that you were working for them? Um, April 2022 until January of 2023. And prior to that, and I, I will ask you to just, um, if you can even move a little bit closer yes. to the microphone, I'll have you speak up just a little bit so I can hear you. Thank you. Um, with regards to uh, working for Secure Health, before that, where did you work? Manchester Police Department, sir. And, and again, I'm going to have to have you just kind of keep your voice up a little bit if you can. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Um, how long did you work for the Manchester Police Department? Since 2015, so eight years-ish. Roughly that long? Yes, sir. Okay. And were you working there in January of 2022? Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple different questions about uh, when you were a Manchester police officer. First of all, were you a full-time certified officer? I was, yes, sir. Okay. And uh, did you graduate from the New Hampshire State Police Training Academy? I did, yes, sir. And when was that? Uh, 2012. To around 2012? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember your academy class number? 163. 163. All right. Um, and let me ask you, uh, with regards to your work with the Manchester Police Department, when, were there any other sort of law enforcement jobs that you had prior to that? I worked for the Laconia Police Department before I went to Manchester. How long in Laconia? 2012 to 2015. 2012 to 2015, and then Manchester from 2015 to 2022? Yes, sir. I did... Um, I retired full-time from Manchester PD, and then I did about a year as a reserve officer working in, uh, like, cybercrime. Okay. So I don't, I don't know if you include that. Okay. Yep, I, that's what I'm asking about is all your experience there. Um, with regards to um, your different duties in the Manchester Police Department, could you explain to us some of the different units that you worked at, different assignments that you had prior to you working in the areas of, um, of being a detective? Yes, sir. Uh, I worked in patrol. I worked uh, midnights for all three shifts, midnights, four to 12 day shift. Uh, I had a canine, a uh, canine saber. Uh, we were primarily on four to 12. Um, I helped create the drone unit, so I was part of the drone unit, and then uh, went up to detectives at that point, sir. And then went to detectives after that? Yes, sir. As a detective, what were some of your responsibilities and duties? Um, I was fortunate enough, I was a cross between general detectives and then also the cybercrime unit. Um, so I assisted in both, uh, like, digital cases, um, ICAC tips, cybercrime tips, uh, and then I also did um, general caseload for detectives. Um, general caseload, what, what is that? Anything from, you know, financial crimes, fraud, homicides, um, filing crimes. And sure. how long did you do that? I believe I went up in detectives in 2021. 
2021? Yes, sir. Uh, separate from that in detectives, did you have any work in doing processing, specifically looking at physical evidence, physical items to see if there's any evidence on them? Yes, sir. And in January of 2022, were you asked to assist other officers in doing a search of a 2010 Chrysler Sebring with New Hampshire registration 4368206? Yes, sir. Where was that search done? Uh, at the Manchester Police Department, and we have a, a vehicle processing bay, uh, which is right outside of where the Sally Port is. I imagine we might hear some testimony later on about this bay. So could you go ahead and describe it for the jury, please? Sure. Uh, the, the bay itself, um, <clears throat> you can only access it from the secured back lot where we park most of the police vehicles. Um, there is a two garage um, sally port. The left side used to have um, like tactical vehicles and then the right side is where we would drop prisoners off or transport tr uh, prisoners. Just to the right of that um, is a single bay garage door that opens up. And then there's also a side door to access it. Um, both are secure. You need a, your ID has to get in. Um, and then inside of that bay, it could fit, it could probably fit a full size pickup if you took the pickup and went sideways. Um, but so it's a good size garage. Yeah. And then we had, so we had um, tools in there for disassembling vehicles. And then we had evidence supplies down there. Um, so if any time, if it was inclement weather or it was a long search, you could uh, utilize the bay. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, what was your role during this search of this 2010 Chrysler Sebring with the New Hampshire registration 4368206? Um, I was Detective O'Leary. He's now Sergeant O'Leary. He was, uh, we called him, we joked around and called him the incident commander, but he was the guy that was in charge of all the crime scene processing. So I was more or less there to assist him. And what were some of the things that you did to assist him, just generally? Uh, generally, um, collecting of evidence items, uh, the, the log, um, if there was any pictures. Um, we were blue starring, um, which is a process to um, uh, try to obtain any blood samples from the vehicle. So um, it sounds silly, but you have to turn the lights off for that. So I was the light guy, um, things like that. <laughs> the light guy, so literally light guy. turn the lights off, yes, turn the lights on? Yeah, and then... Uh, You'd have to set the camera for you know 30 seconds, 60 seconds exposure to take the the, fo uh, the photo. So I would have a flashlight just so we could still navigate a little bit without the direct light. So were you the one administering the blue star? Or that was somebody else. That was Detective O'Leary. All right. Let me ask you, what roles do initials play at the Manchester Police Department when you're labeling evidence? Uh, generally speaking, when I initialed something, it was an item that I collected. Okay. And what were your initials? JMT. So if you collected an item today, if you were going to collect this tissue box, and this was going to be an item of evidence that you uh, went ahead and entered in at the Manchester Police Department, um, how would you have labeled this? Uh, if this box, is your first item of the day. Sure. The box itself would have been JMT1, and then any items inside the box, like tissues, would be JMT1-A-B, and subsequently. Okay. Um, oh, I could see that. So something like, uh, let's like say. Like a backpack. Like a backpack. JMT1, and then if you have an item in the backpack, you want a 1A, signifying that that item A came from 1. When you were assisting in doing the search of this car, were there other officers there to help you as well, besides yes, just yourself there, and Sergeant O'Leary? Initially, there was a lot of in and out, a lot of people checking in. All right. And with regards to the uh, items of, of physical items, of potential evidence that you collected, uh, do you remember how many that you directly took and initialed in uh, the way that you just described for us? Eight. Eight? Yes, sir. Okay. So that would have been, what, JMT 1 through JMT 8? Yes, sir. All right. Was one of those JMT 7 a pink toothbrush? Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
I'd like to go ahead and hand you a couple of photographs, have you look through all of them, and then afterwards I'm probably going to have a couple of questions for you. Yes, sir. First, I'd like to go ahead and show you what's been marked stakes exhibits four through ten. And then separate from that, I'd like to go ahead and show you what's been marked states exhibits 104 through 106. At this point, all of these are for identification only. And take your time. I know there's a little bit. Mr. Tucker? Yes, sir. Uh, generally, uh, with regards to the photographs, do you recognize those photographs? Yes, sir. What are they photographs of? Um, this, <clears throat> if I may, this photograph. Hold on just a second. Oh. Yes, sir. Sorry. Let me go ahead and, and if I can assist your honor. With regards to, um, let's go ahead and start with State's Exhibit uh, 10. Uh, what's that a photo of? Uh, this is the photo. We're just oh. going to keep it down low. We haven't we haven't published it okay. yet, so Sorry. I can't show the jury. <laughs> you, let me ask you this. I'll just go in one at a sure. time. Um, for State's Exhibit 10, do you recognize this? I'm sorry. I apologize. Bring the ID upside down. State's Exhibit 5, do you recognize that photograph? Yes, sir. All right. What is that photograph of? It's the uh, evidence processing bay that I was describing earlier with uh, the silver Chrysler Sebring in there. The one that you searched? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, other than the fact that it has a red sticker on it, does that picture uh, show the car as it appeared to you uh, at different times during your search of the car? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to put that one to the side for right now. Um, separate from that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, ask you about State's Exhibit 4 on this particular one. Uh, do you recognize that photo? No. Okay. Uh, with regards to that particular vehicle, do you recognize the vehicle at all? It looks like the same vehicle, but without seeing the back, it's hard to say. Okay. But it, well, let me ask you, I'm going to direct yourself, your attention to the top right-hand side of the windshield in that particular vehicle, and then have you make a comparison with regards to... I'm sorry, to, Your Honor, I can't hear Attorney oh, Agani. Okay. Oh, sure, I apologize. <laughs> Officer Tucker, what I'd like to do is have you go ahead and look, if you would please, at the top left-hand side of the windshield on State's Exhibit four in comparison to ten and look at the two windshields and as again as a comparison between the two yes sir it's got the same uh, same numbers okay on it. and with regards to also I'm going to have you look at the lower left part of that windshield underneath the hood on states exhibit four and compare it to the lower left part of the windshield on states exhibit ten yes sir okay um, and other than the do those particular numbers match yes sir okay you could please um, ask you about the next exhibit See, yep. Going to this exhibit, State's Exhibit 6. Uh, do you recognize that photo? Yes, sir. Okay, what do you recognize it to be? Uh, it's the same vehicle, but it's the driver's side, um, front and rear of the vehicle, but the doors have been removed. Okay. The doors have been removed? Yes, sir. And let me ask you, when you were searching this car initially, uh, were there, uh, was there anything that was inside the car? Yeah, like all the car parts and stuff, sir. All the car parts? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and let me have you, and are those reflected in that photograph? Yes, sir. All right, if you could go to the next photo then. I'm referring to State's Exhibit, excuse me, is it? I read upside down, seven. I apologize. State's Exhibit two, uh, 7. For State's Exhibit 7, do you recognize that photo? Yes, sir. Uh, what is it a photo of? Uh, the, the front of the vehicle, the driver's seat, passenger seat, but looking in on the driver's seat. So looking in... Okay, looking in the driver's seat, so where the steering wheel is? Yes, sir. Okay, and does that photo uh, show the car as you saw it when you were searching the car? Yes, sir. All right. If you could go to the next exhibit, please. It should be State's Exhibit 8. Yes, sir. Um, what's that a photograph of? Uh, same, same context except from the passenger, or from the driver's front, it's the driver's rear. All right, so move from the, so right behind the driver's yes, seat. Yes, sir. Okay, and does that photograph also accurately reflect the vehicle as you saw it the day that you did, the, you helped out with the search? Yes, sir. And the next photograph. 
Um, and that particular one states exhibit nine, right. I believe? Yes, sir. All right, what's that photograph of? Uh, it's the, the trunk of the vehicle, sir. The trunk of the vehicle? Yes, sir. Um, if you could please, I'd like to direct your attention from nine and also direct it to state's exhibit 103, four. Have you look at those two. Um, do you recognize, let's start with State's Exhibit 103. Do you recognize that photo? Yes, sir. What's that a photo of? It's the trunk of the vehicle, but with more items in it. Okay. Is that how the vehicle initially appeared, or yeah. did you fill it with items, or did you empty it from items? No, I, we emptied it, sir. Okay. And uh, does it also show the registration for the car there? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, State's Exhibit, um, the next one there, should be one of Four? Yes, sir. Okay. And what is that a photo of? Uh, just another close-up of the trunk area with all the items in it. Okay. What kind of items are they? It's like um, steering components. Looks like the front CV shaft and maybe a cross member. Okay. Um, a cross member? Yeah, like the, the front frame, like the cross member. Oh, okay. Frame. Okay. Um, working our way around the car, I'd ask you to look at State's Exhibit 105 and see if you could tell us a little bit about that particular photo. What's that a photo of? Uh, the, the right rear, the passenger side rear uh, with the door open uh, looking in. Uh, did it also have car parts in it, that side of the car? Yes, sir. Can you see that in the photograph? Yes, sir. And is that accurate from when you saw it, when you can, helped with the search? Yes, sir. And if you could go to the next uh, smaller exhibit there, yes. That's 101. 110, one, or sorry, 106. 106. Uh, what's that a photograph of? The passenger front seat. So now we're, we've worked our way around the car to the passenger front seat? Yes, sir, right front. And does that appear as you saw it when you helped do the search? Yes, sir. What were some of the items that were in that seat? More car parts, uh, broken glass, snow, uh, just trash. Um, and does that accurately reflect how it appeared when you did the search? Yes, sir. Right, thank you. One last question for you, separate from these. Um, the last one I believe that we haven't talked about with regards is State's Exhibit 10. Could you tell us what that's a photograph of? Uh, pink toothbrush. Okay, and do you recognize that toothbrush? Yes, sir. Okay, how do you recognize it? It was in the back of the uh, Sebring, sir. Okay, in the, in the back of this car? Yes, sir. Okay. And is, did you, is, is that a toothbrush that you seized and put into evidence? Yes. Okay. And you remember what was the initials that you gave for that one? Uh, JMT7. JMT7. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. With regards to the photograph, um, does it look to, other than the fact that it has a red label on it and somebody on that photograph has put their initials, um, other than that, any sort of changes or alterations to it from how you remember it looking when you collected it? No, sir. All right. At this time, Your Honor, the state, if I could take these back, please, Mr. Deputy. The state will move to go ahead and strike the identification, specifically from the state's exhibits 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, as well as from state's exhibits 104, 105, 106, and to 103, 104, 105, 106. Any objection? No objection to the 100s, um, and no objection to 4 through 9. I thought I heard something about 11. Specifically, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 10. I think 10 may already be, but we would have no objection to it being given. Right. So, no objection, no objection. Uh, other than 11, which wasn't shown. Um, so those can all be marked as full exhibits. The ID can be stricken. Mr. Trucker, what I'm going to do in a moment is I'd like to get these photographs back to you to be able to have up close, but I'd like to also project them on the screen behind you so you can feel free to look either at what is in front of you or what is behind you. It does not matter. Okay? Yes, sir. May we approach? Yes. <laughs> Looks like this is a natural breaking time, so I'm going to, uh, we'll take a 15-minute 15, 15 
mid-morning break now. Uh, I remind you, don't discuss the case with each other or with anyone else. Don't do any independent research. We'll see you in about 15 minutes. Uh, it's my hope that this will actually be 15 minutes. Uh, you can uh, All right, the jury. take a break. Take your break now. Uh, I would like to start on time if we can. All right? You may step down, uh, but don't discuss the case with anyone, please. Yes, ma'am.
You can be seated. Uh, and the witness can come on back up to the witness stand. What did you, did you mark what time the break was? Did you, did you mark what? We have Attorney Brooks. Pardon? Attorney Brooks. She's Everybody ready? Yes. We'll rise for the jurors, please. the jury. <coughs> Please be seated. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Tucker, I had, uh, had gone through a series of photographs with you just before we took our mid-morning break. Uh, do you see that same stack of photographs in front of you now? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, again, what I'm going to do is I'd like to be able to ask you questions about these uh, photos, and I'll go uh, in roughly that order, and be able to, you can either look at the photographs in front of you or feel free to look at the screen behind you, whichever one's going to be easier. Um, and I've got a series of questions for you about how you conducted the search and the appearance of the car. All right? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start with uh, State's Exhibit 103. And I wondered if you could go ahead and uh, describe this photograph for us. Yes, sir. This is the, uh, the trunk of the Sebring with the, uh, the car parts in it. Okay. And uh, you said the car parts in it. Could you just kind of generally point with your hands where those are again? Yeah, this is all part of the car parts. And uh, do you know where those car parts came from? I, I believe they came from the front of the vehicle. Okay. Uh, I believe that's like a CV shaft. It has to do with power to the wheels on the front of the vehicle, but I'm not a mechanic. Okay. And with regards to uh, the license plate, can we see the license plate on the car? Yes, sir. And could you read the license plate for us? Uh, 436-8206. Okay. Moving around to States Exhibit 5, uh, what are we looking at here? That's the uh, front of the vehicle, specifically the driver's side. Okay. And is this also, again, how the car looked that day when you searched it? Yes, sir. Um, and so I guess from that question, uh, is this the bay that we were talking about, the evidence bay that you can do the search in? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I can't help but notice it doesn't have a wheel. Did it have any wheels? No, I don't think it did, sir. Okay. But I wasn't there when they took it from the junkyard. Uh, this is this is the first time I saw it was I came into work and was instructed to go down and help Detective O'Leary. All right. 
Um, right, sir, I'm just gonna I'm gonna need you to speak. Maybe slide your chair over a little yes, bit. Yes, so Speaking into the microphone. Yes, sorry. This is recorded, and we do need to get your voice. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Before I also had you do with him to look on the uh, the windshield specifically of the car. And uh, we, we talked a little bit about it. I'd like to switch now to State's Exhibit 4. Um, uh, this particular car, is this the, the car that, the photo that I had you make a comparison of that windshield? Yes, sir. All right. And showing State's Exhibit 5 and 4 together, 4 being on the bottom and 5 being on the top, uh, do you remember the letters and the numbers that I had you point to in the top right-hand corner of the, the windshield? Yes, sir. Okay. And do we have those both highlighted here on the screen? Yes, sir. And do you remember me asking the question about the numbers indicated on the lower left-hand side of the windshields? Yes, sir. And do we have those also highlighted here on the screen? Yes, sir. So with regards to this car, they're talk we're looking at the same car here between these two photos, right? Yes, sir. All right. Working our way around the car, and I'd like to go ahead and kind of move in a counterclockwise fashion from looking at the hood. Moving now around to uh, the driver's side, uh, can you go ahead and point out for us, uh, when you said that there were car parts in the car, um, show us where those car parts are, and do you recognize any of those parts? Uh, yes, sir. So the driver's seat, um, <clears throat> these are car parts, and then the, the back passenger seat uh, had more car parts in them. Okay. And Do you, obviously the, uh, the floorboard. And the floorboard as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, with regards to the car, those car parts, um, let's go ahead and kind of zoom in, if we would, to the passenger area, or excuse me, to the driver's seat. So zooming in to uh, that same photograph here of the State's Exhibit 6. Um, can you see those car parts a little bit better? Yes, sir. I'd like to go directly to one seat and then the other. So if we could start with the driver's seat, looking at State's Exhibit 7. Um, can you point out where some of these parts are that we're t you're talking about? Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, this looks like the bezel, which would go up here where you're looking at your instruments. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Does look like yeah, some, some underbody parts, like that might be a suspension component, but again, I'm not 100%, but they're definitely car parts. Okay. And moving to States Exhibit 8, if we go into the back seat, right behind the driver's seat, uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, more car parts, sir. Okay. Uh, this looks like it might be essentially an air filter uh, box. Mm -hmm. Not not a hundred percent. And then this looks like it might be a fender well, like uh, up in the inner fender. Okay. Um, and uh, is it fair to say from seeing here uh, we don't see a driver side rear tire as well? No, sir. Uh, moving now kind of to the trunk area, if you could, I'd like to go back to State's Exhibit 103. Uh, you already identified this photo for us as being that particular trunk of the Chrysler Sebring uh, with the car parts in it. Um, I'd like to, if you could, describe for the jury as we look, look at uh, specifically State's Exhibit um, 104, um, what was the condition of these parts that you were looking at? Uh, just like that, they uh, looked like old car parts. Um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't take the car parts out and see if they fit the car, but I assumed that they belonged to the vehicle. Um, was there generally, um, were there any kind of fluids that were coming from any of these parts that you noticed? Uh, not in the trunk, but there was a liner, so it was hard to, it's hard to say. Okay. I feel like the liner would have absorbed it. What about in other areas of the car? Yes. There were? Yeah, I believe so. Like the passenger seat, I think uh, the right front had like wetness. Okay. So I, I really need you to keep yes, your voice up. It's a big room and everybody needs to hear you. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Thank you. I believe the right front area had a uh, wetness. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to zoom in. Did you, uh, did you help remove these parts from the vehicle to help do the search? Yes, sir. Where did they go? I think we laid out a piece of uh, big parchment paper, like mm -hmm. brown, um, like the same material a uh, uh, like a Hannaford's bag, like uh, when you go to the grocery store and you get paper bags. Yes. Just a big roll of that. We laid it out, and they go on that roll. Okay. Did you um, did you help, or did you watch as the car parts got emptied from the trunk? I helped, I believe, yeah. Okay. 
Um, and I'd like to show you now States Exhibit 9 uh, in the, excuse me, zooming in on this portion of States Exhibit 104 in the back corner. Uh, can you tell if there's any particular of a color that's in that particular, in that photo? Color, sir? Yeah, any color that doesn't look like a car part. And f feel free to use the screen or the photograph if you wish. Are you referencing like the, the looks kind of light blue? Look light blue to you? Yes, sir. Okay. Once you emptied out the car, were you able to see what that light blue thing was as we look at States Exhibit 9? Yes, sir. Okay. And what was it? A T-shirt. A T-shirt? Yes, sir. Right. Just, uh, and with that, uh, with that trunk emptied, um, <coughs> excuse me, apologize. With that trunk emptied, Uh, were you able to look farther into the back of the trunk? Yes, sir. Okay. And from there, what were the different items that you saw? Uh, it was, a, I think it was all clothing and then the, uh, the toothbrush. You can see a little bit of it right there. Right where? Right here, sir. And that's inside that circle? Yes, sir. Okay. Were you able to see it? Um, let's say you can see it here from the photo, I take it, correct? Yes, sir. Zooming in on States Exhibit 9, uh, can you show us again where it is that you see it? Yes, sir. Right here. Right there? Yes, sir. Then showing again States Exhibit 10. This is the toothbrush that you recovered from that trunk? Yes, sir. On that toothbrush, testified earlier on in direct that it was identified and that you logged it in as JMT7, is that correct? Yes, sir. I'm going to hand you what's been marked States Exhibit uh, 66 for identification purposes only. Yes, sir. Go ahead and look at the label and peel the bag. recognize um, that particular packaging as well as the inside? Yes, sir. Okay, and what is that packaging? Uh, how do you recognize the packaging? It's the brown bag that I place it into. And does it have your initials on it, JMT7? Yes, sir. Um, at this point, you know, if I'm going to borrow a pair of scissors, I'd like the, uh, the witness to be able to open that. Tucker, since we are talking about a toothbrush, I wonder if you would be willing yes, to sir. put on a pair of gloves for us and be able to open that bag. And then you're going to be putting on a second glove. Can you please tell the jury why? Uh, so most of the time when you're processing crime scenes, uh, there's a lot of evidence and you you put on a fresh pair of gloves every time you collect the evidence, and uh, if you don't have double gloves, your hands become very sweaty, and it becomes very difficult to put on a fresh pair of gloves. So it's just easier, especially if you're doing uh, blood swabs and things of that nature. But that's how I was always taught, so that's how I do it. Yes, sir. You can please go ahead and use those scissors to open up. Do you have a preference on where? Uh, I would say ask, please, uh, if you would please go ahead and cut in an area where there isn't a label. Okay. Maybe on the side. It's large enough for the eye Let me ask you, without taking the item out of the bag, just looking at the bag, do you recognize this one? Yes, sir. What do you recognize this uh, the, the toothbrush from the vehicle. Without objection. All right, the ID is stricken and it is entered as a full exhibit. Mr. Tucker, would you please go ahead and show us the toothbrush?
for the purpose of? Just to be able to show with both sides of the toothbrush. I don't know that the germs in the back are going to be able to see both sides. Yes, he they may do see that. see the front, but they can't see the back from the photo. That's fine. Mr. Tucker, if you would say that. Well, pressure right now, I can trip. Yeah, do be careful. Mm -hmm. Slip right over here. If you can, please, we can see the front of the toothbrush on the State's Exhibit 9, but I was wondering if you would please go ahead and show, show the toothbrush, both show the front, and then also turn it around and show all the sides slowly so that all of the jurors can see. And if you could please turn it around to the back so that the jurors can see what the back of the toothbrush looks like. Let me hold the bag open. You could go ahead and place that back in there. Hold on just a moment. Let's keep that together. That's the only item we would ask you to look at, so I'll get a trash can. Okay. Mr. Tucker, moving on around the car, out of the trunk now, um, I'd like to go over towards the passenger side, if we could. We'll start with the rear passenger side. Looking at State's Exhibit 105 here, uh, can you describe uh, what we can see in this photograph? Yes, sir. Uh, more, more car parts on the seat and then some uh, trash items and looks like a water bottle on the uh, passenger side floorboard. Okay. And, um, I see here that we've got a door on this side. Yes, sir. All right. And um, on the previous side, on the driver's side, were there any doors there? No, sir. Um, moving on from uh, this particular one then to States 106, could you please describe what we're seeing here and what part of the car? Uh, it's the right front, the passenger side front. Um, looks like the headlight uh, is on the floorboard and maybe a... Uh, Reservoir for like washer fluid, okay. something of that nature, and then some snow. And some snow. Can you point out where the snow is? Yes, sir. Thank you. And that headlight, the reservoir, the snow, uh, all of those were there when you saw the car in that garage bay, correct? Yes, sir. None of those were placed there by officers to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Let me ask you, with regards to some of the other evidence that you uh, looked at and collected on this particular uh, item, this particular car, um, separate from the toothbrush, um, uh, were there also a series of swabs that you took in the trunk? Yes, sir. Okay. And how many of those swabs did you take? Four. Four? Yes, sir. And uh, how were those labeled? Uh, Your J initials again? Yes, sir. Okay. And it was just uh, one, two, three, four? Or? Yes, sir. JMT one, two, three, and four. Four. Okay. Um, those particular swabs, could you go ahead and describe for the jury how you collected swabs? You talked about it a moment ago when you showed us uh, how uh, instinctually you use two gloves. Um, when you do these swabs in the trunk, how do you collect those? Um, so for for swabs, when it comes to blood, if we don't, if it's not wet so if the blood's not wet or the the material's not wet urine whatever it is if it's dry um, we have sterile water we take it we pour it into the, the cap mm -hmm. um, each cotton swab contains two in the uh, the package the container um, so you glove up usually uh, I would write all the details on the box there was a, a little cotton swab box um, so I'd write it's folded you assemble it um, so it's easier to write on it mm -hmm. before so you'd write JMT1 um, set it up date time all the information um, put on your gloves 
do the water, get everything ready. And then at that time, because we were, uh, we were using Blue Star on the trunk, there was uh, a, kind of like a limited amount of time because you, you have to have the lights off to see the area that you're going to collect. Um, so you'd spray the Blue Star, it would illuminate, you could see that area, and then you had to turn the lights on and collect it. Um, so I was there waiting, ready with the, the swab ready to go. Um, I see. So, so you're, so to make sure I understand this right, you're not necessarily administering the blue star, but you've got the swabs yes. that you've opened up. Are each one of these swabs, the, the water that you put together, the boxes, are each one of those sterile before you open them to take a swab? Yes, sir. Okay. And, uh, is that also very important for you and take for taking a swab to double glove and to make sure you're using sterile materials? Yes, sir. Those four swabs and the toothbrush, uh, are you aware whether or not those were sent on to a laboratory for examination? I believe the toothbrush was, Okay. Um, but I wasn't aware at the time. I assumed everything that we were doing was going to end up at a lab. If I can have just a moment, please, Your Honor. Mr. Tucker, I've got one last uh, question I want to ask you. Uh, the trunk liner itself, with regards to the four swabs um, that were taken, um, did you also um, collect, I believe you said at the very beginning, there were eight evidence items that you took. Could you please tell us what JMT 8 was? What was the last thing uh, that you cut out? I don't remember. Okay. Um, if you had a chance to look at a report written from the search that day, do you think that might refresh your recollection as to what the eighth item was? Yes, sir. Mr. Tucker, I'm going to go ahead and hand you a um, copy of what's been marked, just a bait stamp, page 111. I'm going to direct your attention down at the... I'm going to need you to raise your voice so everybody can hear you, please. I apologize. Mr. Tucker, I'm going to go ahead and hand you what's been marked, discovery page 111, and I'm going to add, direct your attention down to the bottom of the page. First of all, after having a chance to read through that document, um, uh, I'm going to ask, is that a, a write-up of what the search was that you were a part of for these photographs and for your taking of evidence? Yes, sir. And I'm going to have uh, my question for you was going to be what was the eighth and last thing that you collected. Um, I'm going to have you, you said you didn't remember. I'm going to let you go ahead and refresh your recollection. If it's refreshed, let me know. Just look up when you're done. Yes, sir. It was a uh, part of. Oh, okay, John, take that back. If yes, sir. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And do you recall now what JMT8 was, that last thing that you collected? Yes, sir. What was it? A uh, piece of the trunk liner. Piece of the trunk liner? Yes, sir. So. How did you uh, how did you get or create recover that piece of the truck liner? Uh, we cut it. You cut it? Yes, sir. Okay. What did you use to cut it? I don't remember. All right. And then after it was cut, first of all, you have shown us what you do with gloves and try to pre uh, present and collect things in a sterile manner. Would you have done that for trying to collect what JMT eight was the cutting of the trunk liner? Yes, sir. And would you have logged it into evidence the same way you did the other ones, JMT one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Tucker, I don't have any further questions for you. I believe defense counsel will have a few. Yes, sir. Good morning, detective. I don't believe we've met, but I'm Jamie Brooks with Public Defender, and I uh, represent Mr. Montgomery. I'm also going to ask you some questions about that search you conducted with then-Detective, now Sergeant O'Leary. Do you understand? Yes sir. yes, sir. Yeah, and this search was on January 1st. Your participation in the search was on January 1st, 2022. Yes, sir. And it was the Chrysler Sebring, right? Yes, sir. And it was already in the Manchester Police Department Bay when you saw it. Yes, sir. The pictures that were shown showed what were like the guts or the parts of the vehicle inside, right? Yes, sir. But uh, eventually those items were all removed from the interior of the vehicle? I think so. It, it wasn't by me. You mentioned there being, I don't think you used the word butcher paper, but there was paper that 
O'Leary put down, correct? I don't know if it was O'Leary, but there was paper down, yes, sir. Okay. And the purpose of the paper being down was to put the parts of the car that were in the interior on the ground? Yes, sir. Because not only were you looking for items such as toothbrushes, but you were also looking for latent blood stains, correct? Yes, sir. And you mentioned Blue Star. Blue Star is a latent blood stain reagent? Yes, yes. It reacts with hemoglobin? Yes. It can detect the presence of blood that cannot be seen by the naked eye? Correct. It can detect blood that has been cleaned up? Yes, sir. It can detect minute amounts? Yes, sir. And Blue Star was applied to the entirety of the exterior of the vehicle? That I don't know. I wasn't there for that. You weren't there for that? No, sir. Were you there for the, but you were there for the collection of, of swabs, right? For the trunk, sir. Just for the trunk? Yes, sir. All the same, you were there for when the Blue Star was applied to the exterior of the vehicle. I don't remember that. I remember the trunk. So, okay. are you aware of Blue Star being applied to the exterior of the vehicle? Not that I can remember. You and know? what about the interior of the vehicle? The trunk, yeah. Uh, the state just uh, had you look at a report. Yes, sir. Correct. And that's from the state's discovery? Yes, sir. Bait stamp 111 through 114, state's discovery? If you say so. Do you still have that report up there, Detective? No, sir. If I may. Permission to approach? Yes. Thank you. Do you recognize this document, Detective? Uh, I do, yes. And you indicated you could not recall uh, the extent of the use of Blue Star to the vehicle? I remember the trunk, sir. But you don't remember any other portions? No. Would it help you to look at that report? Uh, yes, but this isn't my report. This is the same report that the state just provided you to refresh, refresh your recollection? Right, but this report was written by Brian O'Leary. So he, he documented the items that I found. Okay. Okay. Do you have any specific recollection of your participation on January 1st of 2022? Yeah, I remember going down. I remember um, helping Brian Blue Star the trunk. Um, I remember helping collect the samples. I remember collecting the items from the trunk. Um, that's, I don't remember doing much more than that for the vehicle. So for you, you believe it was just the trunk? Yes, sir. For the most part, yeah. Well, while we're at it, let's go ahead and talk about the trunk then. So, Blue Star emits a reaction to the hemoglobin, right, by chemiluminescence? Right, it's like a neon green looking color, like neon green, neon blue. Some people say blue. Yeah. Light blue. Right. And your role in this was to make sure that the lighting was correct? Yes, sir. So it doesn't have to be pitch black for Blue Star to work, right? No, but you want you want darkness for the, the camera. You want dim light. Right. And was part of your role to make sure that the camera was functioning? No. No. Detective O'Leary set the camera up on the tripod and had uh, all the settings. You had to use specific settings, um, like shutter length that it's open for type of thing. And you were just ready with the swabs? Uh, yes. And, then, uh, like... and what you were waiting for was to see a, uh, a reaction, right? Correct. And it would manifest itself with a light blue color. Right. It's a light blue color that would last for roughly 30 to 60 seconds. Yeah, it's 
it's not very long. But that 30 to 60 second reaction would suggest the presence of blood. Yes, sir. Blood that the naked eye cannot see. Correct. Blood that could have been cleaned up. Correct. So when there was that reaction, you would take those swabs, right, and get samples? Right. From that area that was illuminated? Correct. And you mentioned two swabs. One swab would be used to later provide to the state forensic laboratory? Right. The second swab you would use for a, a hemostick, right? Uh, it depends. I think the second swab's in this case. I just used it for the next sample. Uh, okay. Let's let's talk about uh, swabs you collected. JMT one. Would that be something that you collected? Yes. And what was that? Do you recall? No. Would it help you to look at something to be able to recall that? Uh, the report, yes. Uh, feel free to do so and okay. just look up when you're done. Yes, sir. So JMT1, what is that? Uh, so you, you want me to describe what's in the report? Uh, from your recollection, if you like, or I, I can just ask you questions about it at this point. It was a DNA swab that you took, right? Right. And it was a, uh, a swab of an area that was positive for Blue Star, correct? Right. And uh, it was by a piece of insulation? I, I can't remember. Uh, okay. I remember the trunk, and I remember uh, we sprayed the Blue Star, lights went off, or you see the areas <coughs> of, that reacted, and then um, we took a photograph, and then we would look at the photograph after and compare, and then take the sample from that area. So a swab was used to tame a sample, and was hemostix also used on JMT1? I don't recall that. Fair to say, though, that the process, this isn't the first time that you've been involved in the Blue Star collection process. It might be. Uh, there's one other time that I know of uh, okay. that was over on Guilford Ave. I just don't remember if this happened before that. But in, in terms of your recollection of the protocol or the proper procedure, if there were any reaction, positive reaction, to the Blue Star, a sample would be collected, right? Right. So JMT1 reflected a swab from an area of the trunk that was, that tested positive for hemoglobin. Let's talk about JMT2. Do you recall what that is? Uh, the, from reading the report, uh, it says in a trunk by a candy wrapper. And this was a swab you took because the item tested positive reacted positively to the blue star mist. Right. JMT4, that's also a swab that you took? Yes, sir. And this was also due to a reaction uh, to the application of blue star in the trunk? Yes, sir. This was uh, in a bumper crease area by uh, the rubber gasket? I, I don't remember. You talk about this on direct, JMT-8. Do you remember, again, what, what that was from? I remember the, the carpet, the trunk liner. I don't remember what part tested positive. Do you know if it was the top or the bottom? I don't, sir. But in any event, because that area tested positive, and it was probably something you couldn't really swab. Right. So because you couldn't swab it, you still wanted to make sure that you collected it. Yes, sir. And that's why you cut out a portion of it. Right. The yes. portion that tested positive. Yes, sir. So again, your understanding of the procedure is that the if something tests positive for Blue Star, it's documented, right, in the form of the camera that's taking pictures. Yes, sir. It's also documented by the collection of a sample from that area, right? Yes. Sir. In the form of a swab. Right. Yes, it's also documented in a police report. 
Yes, sir. Uh, a police report that uh, oftentimes in, ends up in discovery, like this one, right? Yes, sir. Like the report that you're looking at from Detective O'Leary. Yes, sir. So, uh, Detective, were you – I'm just trying to figure out why you only remember the trunk. Is it because uh, that was the only area where there was the positive reaction for Blue Star on the vehicle? No, I think that's just the only area that I, I helped with. And to the best of your recollection, this was – you don't know how many days of processing the Sebring took? No, sir. You were just there for one day? Yes, sir. And that would be January 1st. Right. 2022. I was in and out a lot, sir, but the, the, the day in question, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anything further? Briefly, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Let me ask you, Mr. Jeffrey. You did not spray the blue star in this particular case, correct? No, sir. And... Asked about training and, and, and experience with Blue Star. How many times had you applied Blue Star in the past at different crime scenes to try to discover evidence? I, I can't remember if Guilford Ave happened before. I sprayed some there. Um, a lot of the reason why I think I was involved in this was to, to learn that process, to see Detective O'Leary do it and assist him with it. So at the time that you're assisting with this process, um, how much did you know about Blue Star? You asked a lot of questions about. Um, protocols and procedures and chemo-luminescence. Uh, did you know about all of that at the time that you were assisting? Uh, I was given very, very um, simple instructions that it'll glow um, and that there is a potential that they could be blood. Have you ever mixed up the reagents to use at a, at a crime scene? No. Um, have you ever read the directions that are necessary before you mix up those reagents? No. Um, with regards to Blue Star, what it's good for and not good for, good for, are you aware or uh, do you know whether it can cause a false negative or a false positive response? I was told uh, it can react with rust. And it can react with rust? Yes, sir. Do you still have the photos? Yes, sir. Um, just a quick question. You know, I'll just, all right, I'll just take it. States Exhibit 104. Uh, that's States Exhibit 104 with the registration. Am I reading that correctly? I think it's 103. So excuse me, 103. Let's take 103. Uh, could you find me 104, please? Uh, 104. Yes, sir. So you think that it might react with rust? Yes, sir. And the swabs that are taken, um, get, where do those swabs go? I, I put them into the cardboard container, the swab container. And what was your understanding of where they would be sent? The state lab. State lab. All right. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Tom. This may have been one of the very few occasions that you were involved with a Blue Star application process, yet you're you still understood that the goal was to over-collect, correct, and not under-collect? Right, yes, sir. So if there was any kind of a reaction, uh, you made sure that was your job there, was to collect it, right? Right. So that it could later be determined if it was a true positive, if it was the result of interaction with blood, or from something else, correct? Yes, sir. And when you were there, whatever your participation was, you made sure that you were collecting anything that uh, reacted to the application of the spray. Right. Not, not every, there were some areas that were very, very, very faint that uh, when Detective O'Leary and I looked at it, we said that 
clearly was like a rust seam or something of that nature, so we didn't collect those. Um, but anything else, yes. And Detective O'Leary, to your knowledge, was very familiar with the application of Blue Star. I'll rephrase. You indicated that you had only, this was your first or maybe second time? Yes, sir. And that was part of the reason why you were there, right? Yes, sir. Was to learn from somebody who did know about the application of Blue Star. Correct. Nothing further. Any objection? No objection. All right, you may step down. You are excused. No. Statement called. Next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, the state calls Sergeant Brian O'Leary to the stand. Just go to the stand and remain standing, please. Please be careful of the wires as you walk through. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sergeant, as we are being recorded here today, would you please state your full name and spell both your first and your last name for the record? Brian O'Leary. B R I A N O apostrophe L E A R Y. And, Sergeant, um, I'm going to guess go ahead from your title, but where are you currently employed? Uh, with the Manchester Police Department. How long have you been working for them? Uh, with Manchester for 17 years. 17 years? That's correct. Okay. Um, and are you a full-time certified officer with the department? Yes, I am. Uh, do you remember when you graduated the uh, full-time police academy? I did in 2003. 2003. Do you remember your academy class number? I do, 132. Okay. Currently, uh, what unit are you working in inside the Manchester Police Department and what shift? I currently work the midnight shift as a patrol supervisor. Okay. Did you work last night? Yes, I did. And what time did you get off work? Uh, about 6 o'clock this morning. Okay. Have you had a chance to get any sort of sleep before coming over I have, here? Yes. Okay. Um, if you need us to slow down, if you need us to restate a question, please let either myself or any attorney know, and we'll be glad to do that. So. I will. <clears throat> I'd like to ask, what are some of the different departments and units you've worked in at the Manchester Police Department? I've worked in the patrol division, and I've worked in the detective squad. Okay. And how long have you been in the detective squad? Uh, I was there for approximately nine years. Nine years. Yes. And what are the dates of those years, if you could? 2013 until I got promoted in 2022. Okay. Um, what, are, what were some of your duties when you were in detectives? Uh, I investigated crimes that happened in the city of Manchester, uh, as well as processing uh, crime scenes. Uh, back in... Uh, specifically January of 2022, were you involved in the investigation into the disappearance then of Harmony Montgomery? Yes, I was. Okay. And did you continue to remain involved in that for several months? Yes, I did. I'd like to ask specifically um, about the very beginning of that investigation. Were you asked to work with other officers in doing a search of a 2010 Chrysler Sebring at the Manchester Police Department Evidence Bay with New Hampshire registration 4368206? Yes, I was. Okay. What was your role in the search of that car? Uh, my role was just, uh, to oversee and to help uh, locate, identify, uh, process pieces of evidence, uh, and label pieces of evidence. Okay. Um, how long did it take to do this search? Uh, well, we did over the course of two days. Okay. And with regards to the first day, uh, did you have a detective by the name of Joseph Tucker who was assisting you that day? Yes, I did. Okay. And was he also assisting you the second day, or was that other people? Uh, it was a separate, uh, a different detective the second day. Okay. Who was assisting you the second day? Uh, detective Ray Lammy. Okay. 
Can I ask you, uh, with regards to the collection of evidence, uh, it's our, this jury's understanding that initials of an officer sometimes play a role in how that evidence gets labeled. Can you describe for us how those initials play a role? Um, so if you were to collect a piece of evidence and you were going to put your initials on it, how does that go in uh, into the evidence department? Uh, you would use your typically your three initials um, followed by a number um, that uh, identifies that specific piece of evidence that's being collected. And when you say three initials, are you referring to first, middle, and last name? Typically, yes. Excuse me, sir. Apologize, Sergeant. Just trying to make sure that this is working properly. <coughs> With regards to those initials, um, what are your three initials? B E O. And did you collect evidence in this particular case from this vehicle, or from this 2010 Chrysler Sebring? Yes, I did. Okay. So safe to say then it's going from BEO 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 and on up. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> at some point in looking at this particular vehicle, did you also test it with a substance known as Blue Star? Yes, I did. Could you go ahead and why don't you go ahead and tell us what Blue Star is and what it can do, what your training has been with it as well? Blue Star is a chemical uh, that detects the hemoglobin in blood. Um, so we would generally spray it out of a spray mist container uh, and it, we would get a reaction um, to the hemoglobin in blood. The reaction that we get, um, I would identify it as the, the color of the, uh, the tissue boxes in the front there, the top part that comes up as a uh, fluorescent blue. And you're referring to these tissue boxes on the very top of the jury panel? Th that's correct, yes. Um, the top blue or the lower blue? Uh, the top blue. Okay. And how would you describe that blue? What words would you use? Uh, the, like chemiluminescent. Chemiluminescent? Yes. Okay. Bright blue? Bright blue, yes. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how do you apply Blue Star to something, whether it's an object or a large area? Uh, the process, um, it comes in, there's a plastic container, spray bottle, uh, and then a small little foil packet that has three tablets in it. We open up the three tablets, put it in the plastic container, um, and then we agitate it. We just swirl it around, um, not to shake it vigorously. Um, and once the tablets have dissolved, um, we adjust the spray nozzle um, on the nozzle so that it's a fine mist, uh, not a stream. Um, and then once we have the, the fine mist, then we start uh, spraying whatever we suspect to be um, an area where um, blood uh, could have been or is. When you say that you spray it on, can you kind of describe how you would spray it on? Is it just, you know, me at my house, you know, spraying some Windex on a glass? Or how do you spray it? What's the method you use? Uh, using the Windex uh, example, um, it's not like you're using Windex where you're spraying it directly on the window. Um, the method is you want to be about two feet away from the object um, and spray it slightly above it so it kind of falls down onto the object, not spraying it straight at it. It's more of a, a mist in the air so that it falls down on the object. When you go to use Blue Star, and I take it, uh, how many times have you done that yourself? In my detective career, probably 15 to 20 times. When you go to do that, is there a certain process that you follow each time when you say, okay, I have to go use Blue Star, I'm going to go get reagents? What are the first steps that you do before you get to that step of mixing and agitating? Uh, the first steps, um, I look at the, the item or the area that I'm going to process um, to kind of develop a game plan to figure out how, how we're going to do this. Um, and once I've determined that whatever the area is, it's going to be processed, um, I'll go mix. Um, the Blue Star, as I mentioned before. Um, while that's agitating, um, I'll get a camera ready. Uh, for the camera, we have uh, special functions that we have to set up on the camera. Um, in my time in detectives, I had one camera that was set up, so I would just have to press a button so that it would automatically go to that function. Um, I would double check to make sure that it was on that correct function, that nobody had um, altered the, uh, the program before. Um, and I actually should say, before using the blue star, I'd read the directions just to make sure that nothing had changed from the last time that I'd used it. Um, and all my times of doing it, it stayed consistent uh, with how to use it. Um, I got my camera ready. Uh, I also get a tripod. 
um, because the camera has to go on a tripod because when you are taking a photo, uh, once you have that reaction, you need to have uh, a 30 second or more exposure. Um, so that's what the tripod's for. So it can hold the camera still for the 30 seconds or longer um, as it takes the picture. All right. I'd like to ask you about a couple of those different components that you just explained to us. I think you said that you read the directions every time. Why do you do that? Just to make sure that I'm doing it properly. Okay. And also with regards to the camera and the camera settings, why is that so important? Uh, the directions say um, that it has to be at a certain, uh, set up a certain way so that the lens is open wider when it's taking the photo. Um, because we're also, and I apologize if I didn't mention this earlier, um, we do this in total darkness or with a little bit of light. Um, so that's why we have the long exposure. Um, I would have a flashlight on my person. So when the lights were shut off, we could use the flashlight to, one, help assist us in getting around whatever object we were doing, making sure the camera was set up properly, and then adding just a little bit of light to the area. Um, it's my understanding that the camera will take in whatever little bit of light there is. Um, and be able to take a, an appropriate photo with the so, reaction. So when it comes to lighting, do you actually use other officers to help you have somebody on the light switch? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and you said also that you set up a tripod. Why do you do that? Because uh, the exposure, the once you click the button to take the photo, it's going to be 30 seconds. Um, so if it's on a tripod, the, the camera's not moving. Um, I'm not able to hold the camera for 30 seconds without any type of vibration or anything like that. So that's why we keep it on the tripod um, that takes the photo of the reaction that we see it. Once we see the reaction, the tripod is, and camera is kept in the same location. The settings are readjusted to a normal photo, and then we take a second photo to show that same area if there was a reaction, what it looks like. Um, so you're, so you're taking a photograph if there is a reaction, and then separately the lights come back on. I just want to make sure I got this right. And you're taking a photograph of the same spot with the lights on so we can see what that looks like in regular light. When That's you right. spray on the, the blue star then, does it physically change the color of the object? So, for example, if I sprayed it on this piece of paper, is this piece of paper going to turn blue? No. Okay. No. Um, and so you take that second photograph, why? Why is that important? We take the second photograph uh, if we see a reaction the first time. Um, that way we, you can see the, re the photo that has the reaction, the fluorescent blue, where, those, um, where the reaction is in, on the object, and then you can see it again in normal, normal daylight with the lights on. When you are spraying these items on, um, or excuse me, spraying this material on, um, how big an area do you do at a time? It, it depends on what the object is. Um, I Can I ask a clarifying question on that then? So if it depends on what an object is, so for, say for example, I wanted to photograph something the size of these tissue boxes that are here, and I just want to spray that and photograph that. Um, when I do that, um, am I going to want to have my camera up close or far away? And how many times am I going to take a photo of that, that do you think? Um, so the general rule with, uh, with photography and with scenes is we'd start off with the wide one to show this, this kind of angle, and then we get to a mid-range photo. Um, and then we wouldn't do a, a close-up photo. The close-up photo would just be right of that object. If we're using the example of the shoebox, um, I would probably stand back with the camera probably three feet and still spraying at two feet. Um, slightly above it so the mist would come down. Um, but I also want to try to work on getting um, the, the top of the table part there um, as well as the sides. Separate from that then, let's say I had something that was the size of this table here to my right. Um, which as you can see is certainly longer than I am tall. Um, if I wanted to go ahead and blue star an item that large, uh, what would be the process to do that? Uh, same process as far as taking the photos. Um, something that size, I would probably break it up into maybe a half uh, or even quarters. Um, and with each section that would get broken up, I would take a photo just of that area, just where I'm processing. Um, I wouldn't do the, the big area for this small piece. It would be a photo of this small piece for that small piece. When you use Blue Star, um, can you get false positives sometimes? Yes, you can. What are false positives? Uh, false positives are you would see the same reaction, the same fluorescent blue color. Um, however, it, wouldn't, it doesn't last as long as um, 
what I've seen to be a positive reaction. The positive reaction is uh, from 30 seconds upwards uh, to a minute. Um, the false positives that I have seen, um, it turns the, the bright blue quickly and then it quickly fades. Do you know what it is that can cause these false positives? Uh, it can be different cleaning solutions, bleach, um, uh, some chlorine-based materials, uh, also some type of metals. I know iron was um, was one specifically that, that it mentioned. Do you know if any foods can cause these sort of false positives? I don't know of any foods. I don't know. You said uh, in your experience. So have you seen some of these false positives before? Yes, yes I have. Okay. And if you get a positive, what you think may not be a false positive, uh, would you go ahead and then swab that item? Yes, I would. How do you do that? Um, the swabs, uh, it's like a Q-tip, mm -hmm. uh, except it's about five inches long. Wood, the ones we use, wooden handle, uh, and it's got the, the cotton swab at one end. They come two to a package uh, that's sealed. We'd open the package. Uh, we take one swab out at a time. Uh, we would use sterile water if the sample that we were trying to collect uh, was a dry sample. Um, if it was something that was wet or moist, um, we could just use the swab. Um, so if it's a dry sample, we would take some sterile water, pour some sterile water into the cap of the sterile water container, and we would dip the, um, the swab in the cap, and then we would take a swab of um, whatever we wanted to take a swab of. Generally, um, we would try to use the tip of the swab and just uh, like a little swirling motion. Um, you don't have to get the entire swab soaked in whatever the item is, um, but usually you do want to get a good amount. When you say the tip of the, I'm sorry, you would dip the, put the water in the cap of the uh, sterile water solution. Um, am I envisioning correctly? We're talking about a cap and you would turn it upside down so the inside is what you would be pouring the water into? That, that's correct. It's a, probably about a half inch to three quarters of an inch cap. Um, and once you go ahead and take a swab of something uh, that came back with what you believed may be positive for Blue Star, where does that swab go? Uh, we then put that in a cardboard box. Um, the cardboard boxes come flat. They're probably six inches or so um, and about a quarter of, a, quarter of an inch or so um, in a square. Um, so we assemble that box together. We put the swab in it and we close the swab box. Um, and then to seal the box, we would put evidence tape on both ends of the swab box, label it appropriately with whatever evidence numbers we were using. Um, generally, we put a biohazard sticker on that swab, um, and then we fill out information as far as the case number with the, um, the evidence number. And where do those swabs get shipped to? Uh, the state lab. Okay. Did you apply Blue Star to this 2010 Chrysler Sebring? with the New Hampshire registration 4368206 that we talked about earlier? Yes, I did. Okay. Where did you apply it? Uh, I did the interior and exterior of the vehicle. Okay. I'd like to start with the exterior and kind of work our way in. Uh, when you say the exterior of the vehicle, what parts of the exterior? The entire vehicle. The, the hood, the roof, um, passenger side doors, windows. Um, there were no doors on the driver's side of the vehicle. Um, and I did the trunk everywhere. Sergeant, you've got a series of photographs in front of you that are uh, photographs that specifically are numbered four through ten, as well as states exhibits 103, four, five, and six. Um, I'd like you to go ahead and you look through those for a brief moment. Some will be down there, and some will be up there. This this one as well. Yes, if you would, please. That's 104. Okay. So I'd ask you to go ahead and look through uh, 103, 4, 5, and 6 are the smaller standard paper ones. 104 through 10 are the larger. Okay. Sergeant, you've got a series of photographs in front of you that are uh,
All set, Sergeant? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, specifically, I'd like to go ahead and start, and you can feel free to either look at the photographs that are in front of you, or you can also look at the screen as I project them behind you. Either one's going to be fine. I'd like to go ahead and start with States Exhibit 103. Um, could you, sorry, I don't know why. Right. Could you please look at States Exhibit 103? It's one of the smaller ones. Yes. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes, I do. I wonder if I could just approach the witness for a second. Excuse me. <coughs> Yes, I do. Um, what do you recognize it to be? Uh, that's the Chrysler Sebring um, that I assisted in searching. Okay. And is that the uh, the trunk of the vehicle? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, uh, let me ask you: Was were you aware um, whether or not this car came from a tow lot before you saw it? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, and I'd like to also move on to um, State's Exhibit. Uh, excuse me, five, um, if I could, please one of the larger exhibits, or you can look on the screen behind you. Do you recognize this photograph? Yes, I do. Okay. How do you recognize the car? Uh, it's missing the, uh, the wheels on the front of the vehicle and the uh, driver's side doors. Okay. Now, you stated that the time that you applied Blue Star to, um, I believe you said, to all of the exterior. So does that include all of the hood that we can see here? That's correct. All right. Did you also apply it to the roof of the car? Yes, I did. Uh, windshields? Yes. Okay, I see that we've got two doors missing here on the driver's side, but what about the passenger side doors and the exterior of those doors? Yes, I did. Okay, what about the trunk that we can see sticking up in the back of this photo? Did you apply it there? Yes, I did. From the blue star that was applied to the exterior of the car, uh, did you receive any positive reactions? No, I did not. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so... With regards to the condition of the car, I wonder if you could go ahead and talk to us a little bit about that. Um, what did you feel the condition was when you saw it? Uh, I mean, it's obvious that it had been in a junkyard for uh, a couple of years. Um, it was missing uh, what's seen in the picture here, the, um, the wheels, uh, the doors, um, all the, the guts um, to the vehicle were inside of the vehicle. Um, there was no engine, um, the rear tires were missing. Um, Inside, there were a lot of uh, rust flakes, um, dirt, dust, um, and it had, it had like a moldy scent. Um, some areas were wet and still had some snow and ice in it. So it still had snow and ice in it. That, that's correct. Um, with regards to the missing parts here, um, uh, did you also notice whether or not the engine was missing? Yes, it was. Um, overall, what was the smell of the car? Uh, it was a musty, damp, um, gross smell. Okay. Um, I'd like to go to Exhibit 4 for a moment, please. Um, you recognize this photo? Yes, I do. Okay, what's that a photo of? Uh, the same vehicle, the Chrysler Sebring. The Sebring. Okay. Um, when you applied the Blue Star, what appeared as possible positive tests uh, in the trunk area of the car. Did you get any positive, possible positives there? Yeah, we um, saw a couple areas that had um, some possible, possible positive um, reactions. Okay. And was that on the second or was that on the first day that, was that on you the looked in the day. car? Who was assisting you that first day in collecting those swabs? Uh, Detective Joe Tucker. And you said Joe Tucker? That's correct. Okay. And those four swabs, were they all from the trunk area on the interior, or were there any on the exterior? Uh, interior. interior. Uh, once those four swabs, did you photograph them and apply the blue star in the same manner that you described for us a moment ago? Yes, I did. And uh, once you collected those swabs, where were they sent? Uh, New Hampshire State Lab. Um, did you also use any tools on swabs? The jury's heard this question before. Something called a hemostick. Yes. All right, what is a hemostick? Hemostick is um, a small strip of paper um, that has 
one end, a uh, small portion of it has some sort of chemical on it that also reacts to the hemoglobin in blood. Okay. And did you use any hemostics here? Yes, we did. Okay. Did you use them on any of the spots where you had those um, that blue star positive results? Uh, when we had the blue star positive results, I think I did. I, well, I, I don't want you to necessarily guess, so yeah, I can't. let me ask you, if you had a chance to look at your report, or did you write a report on the search of that car? Yes, I did. All right. And if you had a chance to look at that report, would that help refresh your recollection as to whether you used hemostics on any of those four swabs from the, tr from the trunk? Yes, please. Bait stamp pages 111 through 114. He's just going to ask you, do you recognize that document generally? Take a moment to look through it. Yes, I do. Okay. What do you recognize that to be? Uh, this is the report that I did that documented the search of the Chrysler Sebring. If you had a chance to look at that report, do you think that might refresh your recollection on whether or not you used hemostics on any of those four swabs that were taken from the trunks? Yes. Uh, if you could please go ahead and do that, take your time. And then, is, does that refresh your recollection yes, of what does. that is? Thank you. Let me take the report. Uh, that you used hemostics on from those four in the trunk? Yes. Okay, how many? Uh, four. Four? Yes. So you used four hemostics on the four positive blue stars? Yes. Why would you, yes, sir. Why would you use another testing method after you used the blue star? Uh, we use it as kind of a backup um, just to kind of reconfirm. Um, in the event, in my experience, we have had some that do come out testing for positive. Um, so this way we can at least explain to the lab if we need to that um, it tested positive for uh, Blue Star and then also on the hemostick. And why is that Why is that important to do? You, you say you do that for the lab. Can you kind of explain to us why? I think, they, I mean, they ask us um, if what we've done for processing just, I, I, I guess my assumption is it's on their end, so they know how that they can process it further. So um, they know if it's been treated by other chemicals or what other chemicals have been used on it before. And generally, when you do an application like this of some sort of a testing, do you tell the lab what you did so they know what may or may not be on there? That's correct. All right. um, with regards to the hemostics, can those also present a false positive sometimes? Yes, they can. Have you seen that in your experience? I have, yes. And can you explain what the hemostics look like? I believe you said that they were little strips of paper. How small are we talking? They are probably two inches, two and a half inches in length, an eighth of an inch wide. Um, very narrow then. Very, very narrow, yes. Okay. And then one end, um, it's got a different material on it. I can't remember if it's a different color, um, but it's obvious that that is the end where you um, put whatever reaction or whatever you want to test against um, on that end. Did you use some hemostics on other areas of the car, interior, other clothing that was found in the car, items that were found in the car in general? Yes, I did. <clears throat> and generally speaking, where did you send the ones that came back these presumptive positive from the hemostics? Um, um, where did you send those? Uh, to the state lab. Did you have any that you tested with hemostics that actually came back negative for Blue Star first? That's correct, yes. And did you collect swabs from there as well? Yes. And where did you send those? Uh, we just kept those at the police department. Okay. Uh, later on, do you know if any of those were sent to the state lab? I don't recall. Okay. Did you also, um, I believe you said before that you had, um, oh, excuse me. Uh, no, you didn't. Have, were you ever involved in a search of 77 Guilford Street? Yes, I was. And what was your role in that search? Um, I was asked to Blue Star uh, a, a little section of the basement area. Okay. Um, of a section of the basement area? That's correct. Okay. And other than that, did you have any other role to play in the search of that Guilford Street address? 
Um, I had to go back another time for um, a secondary search using Blue Star uh, in a different area of the basement. Um, and then I also assisted um, in a, a search of the property at 77 Guilford Street. With regards to the two Blue Star applications at 77 Guilford Street, um, were they so you said one was in the basement. Where was the second one about? Uh, in the basement as well. And also in the basement. And did either of those produce any positive results? No, they did not. Um, what about the search of 644 Union Street later on? Uh, were you present during a search of that residence? Yes, I was. All right. And who was primarily doing the search of that residence? Uh, representatives from the FBI. And what was your role that day during that search? Uh, my role is uh, just mostly being an observer. Um, if they identified something that was going to be taken as evidence, um, they would physically collect it from where it was, um, pass it off to myself, and I would bring it down to another representative from the FBI who would complete the, um, the evidence log and collect that piece of evidence and do their, their own documentation. Um, just a brief moment, please, Rob. Sergeant so Leroy, I just have three last quick questions for you. Uh, with regards to the search of the trunk, you stated that you applied Blue Star, as I was correct, and you took four swabs. Were those four swabs from areas that tested presumptively positive yes. under the Blue Star? Okay. And uh, did you see any other uh, indications back there uh, that you deemed to be false positives? Yes. Okay. And how many? Do you remember? Uh, almost maybe three. Three or four, uh, I mean, two or three in the in the trunk area. Okay, two or three in the trunk area. Yes. Okay, and with regards to the rest, the other areas of the car, did you find food wrappers in that car or food containers? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, just one or multiple? I found multiple. Um, there are like snack packs, um, some baby bottles, um, some baby food containers, uh, and other miscellaneous wrappers. Of, for food. In your search of the car, were there a large number of pieces of evidence that were taken out that were assigned with your name, BEO1, BEO2, BEO3, things yes. like that? Okay. And um, were those ones that all that you had seized and then again got logged in under your initials? That's correct. At this time, Sergeant O'Leary, I don't have any far further questions for you. Uh, I believe uh, we may need to see the court for a brief moment, but then Defense Counsel will have a few. Thank you. Gentlemen, um, I think this is a good natural breaking point for you all to break for lunch. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna release you for lunch. I remind you, don't discuss the case with each other or with anybody else. Make sure that you are keeping an open mind. Don't do any research. Don't look up any media. Uh, and uh, we will see you after the lunch break. If you would return at one o'clock, please. All rise for the jurors. Sir, uh, I am going to have you come back at 1 o'clock. I'm you. sure you're tired, but uh, I needed to give them a break. So. Thank you. All right. Uh, everybody, 1 o'clock? Yes. You may step down. Yeah. Okay, give me one minute. You may sit down. I, I reviewed the letter. I just want to review the, the draft order.
typically we would get this electronically, so I don't usually give a signed copy back that's not already filed. So I can do this one of a couple ways. Um, I can just, if you take a minute, I'll get three signed copies and get them to each of you, um, or I can give it to you and you can take it downstairs and make copies and upload it. Might make sense. I, I'm, I'm fine either way. I don't know that the state has a preference for Okay, so just maybe just wait a minute and I'll get you signed copies of, uh, I'll get you copies of the, both the letter and the order uh, for Attorney Sheehan and each of the parties. Okay, so just give me one minute. Thank you.
see then? Council, those CDs will get to you in tomorrow morning, okay? Thank you. T Sorry. Tomorrow morning to tomorrow morning for the CDs. Yes. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I was. Uh, that's okay. I just wanted you to know. You know, maybe we'll stop a couple of minutes early if I can today, so that staff can work on that at the close of the business day. Thank you. It's used for, yeah. Let's take this one back, um, and we'll just have the. Oh, I see. Because your voice, you just have to speak louder. I, I can speak. Um, you can do it. Tell my spouse that you are. Uh, <laughs> I, to, um, I will definitely speak louder, and um, I will be much more cognizant of if I need to move about the well to grab the, that microphone, so we can leave this one here permanently. And um, I do leave that one back here. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, yes, please. Thank, thank you. Shall we put the witness back on the stand? Just have one brief one just to say. Attorney Gotti, if you if you want us at any point to lower the lights or defense, if you want us to lower the lights because you're showing something on the screen, then just let us know. Okay. Um, all right. Now we're gonna put the witness back on the stand and just be careful of the wires, please. Yep. Thank you. Everybody ready? Yes, sir. All rise for the jurors, please. Please be seated. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Right. Good afternoon, you detective. Sure that you remain under oath. Yes. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. We met, what, about a month and a half ago, December 29th, for a deposition in this case? Yeah. I know we met. I don't know if it was that long ago or no. My, my time does move pretty quickly yeah. sometimes. But so in any event, I'll just be asking you uh, many of the same questions that I asked you then. And I just want to begin by asking you about the experience with Blue Star you had uh, up to that day of January 1st, 2022, when you processed the Chrysler Sebring, or began rather the processing of the Chrysler Sebring. Up to that point, approximately how many times had you previously professionally used Blue Star for processing? Uh, a rough approximation would be probably 15 to 20 times that I'd used it. And you use that experience in processing this particular uh, item, correct? That's correct. That item being the Chrysler Sebring? Yes. It was already in the Manchester garage bay when you saw it, right? Yes, it was. Missing tires? Yes. And I believe you described them as guts, but a lot of car parts were actually inside That's correct. the vehicle. Yes. So for using the Blue Star, one of the first things you have to do, obviously, is mix the, the chemicals, correct? Yes. And it is your practice before doing so to always reread the instruction manual. Yes. 
it, it never hurts just to make sure you're following it correctly, right? That's correct. And as you mentioned, there's the possibility that the instructions could have changed since yes. the last time. Yes. So you implemented that same practice here. Before processing the Sebring, you reread the instructions. Yes. And I think you had also indicated that the instructions are fairly idiot proof, I think you had said, but yes. um, all the same, you made sure to comply with those instructions in the processing of the Sebring. Yes, I did. You applied, well, let me, let me just back up. Uh, it took a while to process this car, right? Yes, it did. Two different dates? Yes. January 7th was one? Yes. The second date was the 7th? Yes. On the first, uh, Detective Tucker assisted you? Yes, he did. For at least part of the time? Yes. And then on the second date, the 7th, Detective Lamy helped you, right? That's correct. And again, your goal with the Blue Star was to uh, apply it to every nook and cranny of both the exterior and interior, correct? Correct. And before doing so, you obviously, uh, you dim the lights in the bay. In the bay, they're either on or they're off. Um, okay. There's no dimming feature to it. But uh, there was some light maybe potentially, but it doesn't have to be pitch black for you to be able to see the blue star, correct? We would use the, the flashlight that I had. With the exterior, there were, there were no positive reactions, right? Correct. A positive reaction you've learned through your training experience lasts about 30 to 60 seconds. That's correct. And it is that top blue color uh, on that Kleenex box that's, that's on the that's by the jury, right? That's correct. And you're able to distinguish that from uh, what's called a false positive? Correct. Probably the same color, but it's more like a flash, right? Yes. It lasts for just a few short seconds. That's correct. There are a few things that can cause a false positive, one of those being a cleaning agent, right? That's correct. So sometimes in your investigations, a false positive can itself have some evidentiary value, right? That's correct. It may suggest that efforts were made to try and clean whatever object it was that you, you were processing. That's correct. Let's now talk about the application of the Blue Star to the interior of the vehicle. Before doing so, you place down some butcher paper on the garage floor. That's correct and you removed the items from the interior of the car. That's correct. And when I'm talking about the interior, uh, there's the trunk, and that's been pretty well covered, but there's also the, the cabin. That's correct. The, the passenger cabin. Yes. Uh, the front seats and rear seats. Yes. So you removed the, any items, including car parts, from the interior before applying the Blue Star? Yes, I did. And you applied the Blue Star in the, man, in the manner specified to you in the instruction manual? Yes. Again, it's not like a, uh, a, a burst. It's, it's a, a light spray that you're trying to provide, right? That's correct. You don't need to saturate it or anything. Correct. But you want to make sure that you apply that mist um, over the entirety of the vehicle. That's correct. And the interior. Yes. This would include the steering column. Yes. Center console. Yes. Driver seat. Yes. All the seats for that matter. Yes. And that's what you did. Yes. And there was no positive reaction. That's correct. No positive reaction on the steering column? Correct. Steering wheel? Correct. Driver's seat? Correct. The entirety of the passenger seat? Correct. Or the center console? That's correct. And that's what you documented in your report? Yes. Uh, a report which uh, was later uh, provided as discovery? Yes.
and, and so just to be clear, uh, this was the entirety of the interior that you applied the Blue Star. Yes. That would include the not just the, the front passenger cabin, but the entirety of the rear passenger cabin. Yes. That would include the all of the rear seats. Yes. And that would include the entirety of the the, the seat for yes. the pass the for the back passenger. Yes. Uh, and crevices. Yes. And again, there was no reaction. Correct. False or negative? Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. You may step down. Thank you. Please just watch the wire, sir. And Mr. Badero, can you just remain standing and sure. raise your right hand? Sure. Do you swear that the testimony that you're about to provide this jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Sir, yes, sir. Have a seat and make yourself comfortable. There's some water in Thank you. How are you doing today, Mr. Badero? All right. Can you start by stating and spelling your full name for the record? My name is Anthony Bodero, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-B-O-D-E-R-O. -E and sorry, we're just getting set up, Mr. Badero. I apologize. It's okay. Take your time. Sure. Sure. Mr. Badero, what's your date of birth? August 30th of 1973. And how far did you go in school? Uh, high school, I mean, 11th grade. 11th grade. What's the current city that you reside in? Manchester, New Hampshire. And how long have you lived here in Manchester? Like 13, 14 years. Mr. Badero, you, are you familiar with an area in Manchester called the Colonial Village Apartments? Yes, sir. And how are you familiar with that area? I used to reside at the residence here. Okay. And again, Mr. Badero, we're making a record, so I'm just going to ask, there's a little microphone in front of you. I'm just going to ask that you speak into that and, and as loud as you can. I used to reside at Colonial Village. 
How long did you did you live in Colonial Village for? Um, lived there for like four months at one time, and then like another four or five months after that. And what were the periods that you lived there? What years? Uh, I lived there from July of 2019 to, I would say, I think it was March of the following year. Yes, March, March of 2020. Okay. And who did you live there with in, in that period that you just mentioned, the July 2019 to March 2020? I live with a friend of mine. And, and what's your friend's name? Her name is Tanya Clement. And what were the circumstances? What was the arrangement that you had with, with Tanya, that living situation? Uh, we would share the bills for the rent of the apartment. While you were living there during that period that we're discussing, so not the later time, but the, the July to March, um, did you own a vehicle? Yes, sir. And can you tell these jurors what kind of vehicle you owned? Uh, I owned, I believe it was a 2004 Audi S4 in blue. Uh, would you recognize that vehicle if you saw it today? Of course. Yes, you may. So, Mr. Madero, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as State's Exhibit 22. Exactly. Do you recognize that? That's definitely my old car, yes. And so you recognize it as your old car? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm sure I'm going to ask you the big courtroom to that everybody speak louder. wants to hear you, so okay. please keep your voice up. Yes, that was my vehicle. Okay. Is this a fair and accurate representation of your vehicle? Is yes. this what your vehicle looked like, in other words? Yes. Your Honor, at this point I move to strike the ID and mark as full States Exhibit 22. Any objection? Bailey approach? Yes. <clears throat> And Mr. Badero, you said you recognize this vehicle, that this is a fair and accurate yes, sir. photograph of your vehicle. Yes. Um, is this what your vehicle looked like the last time you saw it? Yes. It is? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this point, I move to strike ID and Marcus Paul States Exhibit 22. No objection. All right, the ID is stricken. It's entered as a full exhibit. And may I publish, Your Honor? Yes, you may. So, Mr. Badero, that, that exhibit that I just handed you, the photo of your car, I, I put it up on the, the screen behind you. Can you take a look at that for a moment? And, and can you tell these jurors what, what that image is of? What the image is of? Yes. My vehicle. And I think you said the last time you saw it, that's what the vehicle looked like? Yeah. What yes. happened to your vehicle? after you left the Colonial Village Apartments? Uh, it was sitting for about two years at my in-laws. Why was it sitting at your in-laws for two years? I, couldn't, I, I could not get it started. Mr. Badero, at some point uh, between when you left that vehicle for two years at your in-laws and today, did you agree, did you consent to a search of that vehicle? Yes. And, and was that with the Manchester Police Department? Yes. Mr. Badero, I want to switch gears. Do you know someone named Adam Montgomery? Yes. 
and, and you can reposition yourself, that's fine. Um, how do you know Mr. Montgomery? I happened to meet him August of 2019. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Mr. Bader, I'm showing you what's been admitted as State's Exhibit 101. Do you recognize the individual that's depicted in this photo? Yes, sir. And who do you recognize that to be? As Adam Montgomery. Right, and may I publish? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> and Mr. Badero, is this the same Adam Montgomery that you <laughs> that you um, that you met in August of 2019? Yes, sir. How often would you interact with Mr. Montgomery back in 2019? I saw him every, maybe every few days or something like that. How about Kayla Montgomery? Do you know someone named Kayla Montgomery? Yes, sir. And how do you know her? I happened to meet her in 2013. 2013? Yes. How did you meet the defendant in August of 2019? Um, I needed a ride to the Rockingham Courthouse for, to dispute a driving without a license ticket, and I needed a ride, so I happened to call a friend of mine, and he didn't have his car, so he said that he was with a friend of his, and that he would ask him if he can give me a ride. He called me back, told me that the guy said okay. Then him and Adam Montgomery came to pick me up to take me to court. And when they arrived, they arrived with three children, with Harmony and the two boys. And you mentioned Harmony and two boys. Did you see those three children after that event? Yes. When did you, when did you, let's talk about, when did you last see Harmony? The last time I saw Harmony was the second and last time I ever saw her, and that was about three weeks to a month later after the August incident. I saw them, I saw her with them where they resided at. Uh, Mr. Badero, I want to switch gears with you again. Have you ever been convicted of a uh, felony drug charge? Yes, sir. Were you, in fact, convicted of, of felony drug possession in 2014? Uh, 14. I think so, yes. How about in 2016? Yes. How about in 2019? No. And Mr. Badero, did you provide testimony to the grand jury related to this case back in, in March of 2022? So March 21st of 2022? I believe, yes, sir. And do you remember being asked in that grand jury proceeding whether or not you sold drugs to the defendant back in 2019? Yes, sir. Did you provi provide an honest answer to that question? No, I did not. During that grand jury testimony, were you given any type of immunity before you were asked that que the question no. about drugs? And after your testimony, after your grand jury testimony, uh, did you agree to meet with, with, with investigators regarding the case? Yes, sir. And was that in September of, 22, of 2022? Sounds about right. At that point, had you been provided any type of immunity regarding drug activity? Uh, no, I don't think so. Do you recall uh, agreeing to meet with those investigators, signing a written document? I did agree to meet with them, yes, with an attorney. Did you have an understanding about how your statements could be used, whether they could be used against you? Yes. What was your understanding of that? That they would not use it against me as long as I told the truth. And you mentioned having an attorney. Yes. Is that attorney here with you today? Yes, sir.
And regarding your testimony here today, have you been provided immunity based on that drug information? Yes, sir. Before testifying today, you were provided immunity? Yes, sir. Based on that, Mr. Badero, I want to ask you questions about your sale of drugs back in 2019. Specifically, back in 2019, did you, did you sell drugs to the defendant, Adam Montgomery? Yes, sir. Did you sell drugs to Kayla Montgomery? Yes, sir. How often would you sell the defendant and Kayla drugs? Whenever I had any available. How frequently was that? Not frequent. Were you actively selling drugs back then? When I did have, yes. Um, and how would they pay you when they would when they would purchase those drugs? They would either pay me with cash or they would sell me food stamps. Let's talk about that. Yes, sir. What do you mean when you say they would sell you food stamps? Well. They would, I would give them half of whatever they gave me in food stamps. Let me back up. What type of drugs were they buying from you back then? Um, heroin and crack. Mr. Badero, did the defendant, in this case, Adam Montgomery, did he ever sell drugs for you? Negative, no. Did you ever employ Mr. Montgomery to sell drugs for you? No. Did you ever hire him in any capacity? No. Mr. Badera, I want to turn your attention to Thanksgiving of 2019. Does that time frame stand out to you? Yes, sir. And can you tell these jurors why that stands out to you? Because they approached me saying they had no place to live and I let them stay in my vehicle. And can you describe that arrangement where you let them stay in your vehicle? Well, the reason I had them stay in the vehicle is because I was living with somebody else that it was their apartment and there was no room to, for them to be there. So the only choice I had was to let them stay in my vehicle. And do you recall the specific, let me back up. How many days did they stay in your vehicle? Two for? days. Two days? Yes, sir. Do you recall the specific, the specific days? No, it was just after Thanksgiving weekend. And Mr. Badero, who stayed in your vehicle? Adam, Kayla, and the two boys. Earlier you mentioned Adam's third child, Harmony. Yes. Where was Harmony during that time where you let them stay in their vehicle, in your vehicle? I do not know. Was she with them? No. Did you see her at any point during that, that period where they were staying in your vehicle? No, sir. And do you recall how they came to be living in your vehicle? What, what was, can you tell the jurors what that conversation was like? Well, from what I recall, they gave me a call <coughs> and told me they had no place to go. They came to where I was staying at. I let them upstairs. We talked and I told them, I was like, I could let you stay in my car but I can't let you stay here because this is not my apartment. That was the arrangement. The car that you allowed them to stay in, was that the same car that I showed you an image of? Yes, sir. Moments ago? Yeah. Mr. Badero, back in late 2019, did you have a Facebook account? Uh, yes. What was your, your Facebook name back then, if you can recall? Um. Anthony Tone Capone Bodero. Anthony Tone, sorry? Capone, Capone. Capone. Bodero. Is that your full name or? No, that's just a street name. Tone specifically, is that what you go by? Well, they call me Tone Tony. Were you friends with the defendant on Facebook, the defendant in this case? Yes, I believe so, yes. Do you recall what his Facebook name was back then? I believe it was his name, Adam Montgomery. <clears throat> how often would you communicate back then, late 2019, how often would you communicate with the defendant? I, I don't remember, sir. How would you communicate with him? 
telephone mostly. Did you communicate with him on Facebook at any point? I don't recall, but I wouldn't doubt it. So I want to talk about those two days when they were staying in your car. The defendant, Kayla, and their two sons. Um, did you take them anywhere during those two days? No. Do you think that seeing your Facebook messages might refresh your recollection regarding whether or not you took them somewhere? I guess. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes, you may. I think you said this already, Judge, but may I approach the list? Yes, you can. Thank you. So, Mr. Badero, I'm just handing you, I'm actually, sorry, I can just have this. <laughs> so, Mr. Badero, I'm showing you it's been marked for identification as State's Exhibit 107. I'm just gonna ask that you you look this document over, paying attention to this page. I'm gonna read that? To the, yourself. The whole thing? Or this, the, or this page? That page to yourself, and then just look up to that. So, Mr. Badero, first let me ask, does that refresh your recollection regarding whether or not you drove the defendant? To tell the truth, I don't even remember. Okay. The item that you just reviewed, what do you understand that to be? Um, I guess they must have reached out to me. They needed to go to the clinic. They asked for a ride, and I guess I must have told them, give me 20 minutes. I just woke up, and I guess I must have took them to the clinic. Okay. Let me ask you this. Is that a conversation between yourself and the defendant? I don't even remember. It could have been with Adam or Caleb. Okay. Mr. Badero, as part of um, your involvement with this case, did you provide consent for officers to search your Facebook account? Yes. Mr. Badero, during that two-day period where the defendant slept in your car, did you allow him to drive your vehicle at all? I don't think so. I wouldn't let nobody drive my car. And seeing those messages, does that refresh your recollection at all regarding whether or not you took them to the methadone clinic? It does not, sir. And do you recall specifically having those communications with the defendant? No, I do not. Mr. Badero, when the Montgomery stayed in your vehicle, how often would you see them? Not much. What does not much mean? Like, I was upstairs in my apartment with my wife and I hardly went outside. 
Mr. Badero, do you recall uh, sitting down with investigators and talking to them about that period of time? Yes. Do you recall telling them specifically that you rarely saw the defendant and Kayla during that period? I rarely saw them, but I wasn't checking on them. Were you aware of their, their living situation prior to them living in your car? Uh, not sure, just I know they told me they had no place to go and that's why I let them stay in the car. And at that time, were you aware of where they had been living immediately before then? I don't recall. Do you recall whether they were staying in their own vehicle prior to using yours? No, I don't. Those rare times that you would see them, um, how would you see them during that period? Um, they would come see me. After I served them, they would leave. And when you say they would come see me, is that the defendant and Kayla or is that someone else? They either came together or separate. Do you recall telling those investigators that they were always together? Yeah, they were always together. During those two evenings, or those two days that you allowed them to stay in your vehicle, did something happen to your vehicle during that time? Uh, yes. Um, the first night, I guess, from what they told me, Kayla does not, didn't know how to drive a manual transmission car. She turned it on for the heat, and it killed the battery. And I guess when he woke up, he went somewhere, supposedly from what they said, he went somewhere in the middle of the night to get a portable car charger. So by the time I, the next day when I came out, they already had the car started. So I don't know, I wasn't around, so I don't know. Mr. Badera, do you recall specifically who told you that information about Kayla starting the car? Um, they were both telling me, they were both together. Do you recall telling investigators that the defendant actually gave you that information? No. They were both together when you learned it? Well, yeah, they were both together. And I'm sorry, you said that earlier. They were always together? Yes. Both. Yeah. Did you provide them uh, any items during their two, two days in your vehicle? Yes. Um, Can you tell the jurors what you gave them? I, I gave them um, leftover Thanksgiving dinner one night, and then the following day, I bought, uh, bought two pies from Domino's Pizza, and I gave them a pie, and I still with a pie for me and my, my wife. Mr. Videro, if I can have just a moment. Brief follow-up, Mr. Badero. Um, you mentioned uh, seeing where the uh, seeing where the defendant resided. Can you tell the jurors where that was? Um, I always forget the name of this where it's at, but I went there one time to bring them some food. Okay. Was it a house, an apartment, something yes, else? Yes, it was a house. How would you describe that house? And it was a small little house. And would that have been? What time of year was that? That was in September 2019. September 2019? Yes, sir. Can I approach you? Yes. Mr. Badero, would you recognize that house if you saw it again today? Yes. I'm showing you what's been published admitted and published as State's Exhibit 1. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, and when you say, yeah, that's it, what do you recognize that to be? I reckon that to be the house where they were residing in. That house at Gilbert Street? Yes, I believe that's the name of the street. How many times did you go to this house on Gilbert Street? I think maybe 
I only remember the one time, but it could have been twice. But I remember only one time. I didn't go visit them. So I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Badero. No well, further questions, Your Honor. I pass the witness. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Badero. My name is Caroline Smith. How are you? All right. Good afternoon. A little bit nervous? Always. Okay. And um, I think your first introduction to this case was when marshals came to uh, speak to you? Yes. In January of 2022. Yes. And you wanted nothing to do with this case, right? Well, I didn't know anything about the case. So yeah, except for what you read in the paper, right? Except for what the officers told me. Okay, and you did. You said I've got no involvement with anything involving a child, right? Exactly. I, yes. yes. No way, right? No. Okay, and uh, you got subpoenaed to the grand jury. Yes. And uh, they had you swear an oath there to tell the truth, right? Yes. And um, they gave you some ground rules about your testimony at the grand jury, right? What you mean ground rules? Okay. Well, they told you that um, you could refuse to answer a question if it would incriminate you, right? No, they didn't tell me that. They told you you had the right to be represented by an attorney, right? Yes. And uh, that you had the right to refuse any answer in the grand jury, but only if that answer would incriminate you. Do you remember that? I don't remember that, no. Okay. Let me show you a copy of a transcript of your grand jury, okay? Sure. So first of all, that was a long time ago, right? Yes. And. Uh, does March 21 of 2022 sound about right? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to show you a copy of, uh, you can see on the outside, grand jury proceedings, right? Yes about the disappearance of Harmony Montgomery. Yes. And uh, you were sworn in at the beginning of the grand jury, right? Yes. And I want you to go through and I'm going to take you from the bottom of page three into page four and ask you to read that to yourself, okay? And then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. said bottom of page three? Yeah, in the page four. Where, where the bottom? From, from here? From sure, here? sure. Why don't you do that? Does that refresh your recollection? 
No. Okay. In the transcript to the grand jury, well, while you were in the grand jury, you were advised that you had the right to refuse an answer, to answer a question if it might incriminate you, right? From what it says here, yes, I guess. Okay. I just don't remember. Okay, that's fine. And it says that, uh, yes, you understood, right? Yes. So, um, you also said you lied to the grand jury, right? Yes. Okay. And being advised that uh, you had the right to refuse to answer a question or you had the right to an attorney, you chose to lie under oath. I didn't know that I was going to need an attorney. Okay. So I agreed to answer their questions. So when the question came up to something that would incriminate you, you chose to lie rather than ask for an attorney, right? I got scared, and I didn't think about what they told me about asking for an attorney. Sure, sure. And you were scared because uh, they thought you had information about Harmony, right? Yes. And you didn't want anything to do with this, right? Of course. You didn't want to be implicated in this in any way at all, right? No. Okay. So, um... I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. You uh, talked about meeting Adam because you needed a ride to court. Yes. And uh, you didn't have a license that day, right? No. Have you ever had a license? No. Um, you did not have a license in November of 2019 then, right? No. If you've never had one, you I've didn't have one. I've never had one, exactly. Excuse me, and you didn't have one in December of 2019? No. Okay. And uh, in, you talked about your prior convictions, and one of the prior convictions I think that you said was uh, possession of a controlled drug from 2018? Yes. And that was actually possession with intent to sell, right? Or dispense? I guess. I don't, remember. I don't recall. Okay. If I showed you a copy of uh, the record of that conviction, would that help refresh your recollection? Uh, maybe. Okay. I'm going to show you what is a certified copy of a um, conviction returned from Superior Court, state prison sentence for Anthony Badero, right? Yes. And January 12, 2018? That's when I was released. That was the day you were sentenced. So well, actually, I, okay. I got released as well. Yeah, because you were actually in jail pre-trial, and the day you got sentenced, you got a suspended sentence, and they released you. All I know is they, they let me go. Okay. And uh, so you got a sentence of three to six years with all but 92 days suspended. Does that sound right? No. I believe it was the 92 whatever days time served and then suspended time after. Right. Okay. I may have said it wrong because I have Did. gotten a little bit tired. Okay. So it was three to six years as a sentence. All of that was suspended except for the 92 days that you had already served. Yes. So when you mean you got released, you were held on bail before the conviction, and the day you got sentenced, you were let out. Well, they picked me up from a state prison. I did a bit in a state prison. They picked me up. I did 92 days here in Valley Street, and then I got released. Gotcha. Okay. And so then you had a suspended sentence hanging over your head yes. of three to six ex minus that 92 days. I guess, yes. Okay. And that was suspended for three years? Yes. Okay. And then in November 22nd, 
2019, you got another drug charge? No. Drug conviction, sorry. No, we'll say that again. When? November 22nd, 2019, you got convicted on another charge? No. Okay. That's wrong. Go ahead. So I think I was going to show you another certified copy of another conviction, okay? Yes. I can show you return from Superior Court, Anthony Badero, sentence November 22nd, 2019. Sorry, I don't know anything about that. The last time I did the time for drugs was in, I came home in 2018. Sure, because on this one you got a total two to four suspended. Do you remember that? No, I don't. Okay. And um, your attorney was um, Attorney Sheehan? Yeah, that was from the old case. That's not, I have it confused. Okay. It can't be 2019 because I never got caught with drugs or anything after 2018. Okay, so let's take a look at this. On June 24, 2019, you were driving without a valid license, right? That, yes. And while you were driving without a valid license, they found drugs in your car. No. Basis? No. No. <laughs>
and I am moved to introduce this as the next exhibit, and I don't know where we are. Jay? Mr. Badero? Yes. Okay. Uh, by the way, you have some stuff here that maybe we'll take away because I'll focus on something else now, okay? No problem. So I have in front of me what's been um, marked as a full exhibit, uh, a certified copy of your conviction from November 22nd, 2019. And we went over that first page. Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm going to go over the second page. And that second page is the sentence that you got on that conviction, right? I see what you have there, but that's not what it was for. I was caught driving without a license. Okay. And uh, you got, according to this document, you got a sentence of two to four years suspended for three years, right? Yes. That means that that two to four years you don't spend in jail or prison it hangs over your head for three years. Yes. With conditions that you stay arrest free and commit no new crimes and stuff like that, right? Yes. And another condition was that you got a LADAC evaluation and within 60 days uh, provide proof to the state, right? What's LADAC? Uh, drug and alcohol uh, evaluation. Do you remember that? Kind of. Okay, so now we're going to go to the actual charge that that was based on, and that's the indictment. You've seen indictments, right? Yes. And the indictment is for activities that you did on or about June 24, 2019. Is that what it says? Yes. And the activity that you did was possession of a controlled drug. Is that right? what it says. And this was in County of Rockingham, right? Yes. And it was Superior Court, right? I guess, yes. Like this court, Superior. Of course. Okay. And then you also had with that a misdemeanor for uh, driving after revocation. Okay. With a sentence on the same day? That's what it says. Okay, and your sentence for that was 12 months in the House of Correction, all suspended for three years, right? Okay. Meaning that you got another year hanging over your head for that three years, right? Yes. And one of the conditions here was that you not drive until you are properly licensed. Yes. So you got arrested for both of those things at the same time, right? All I recall is getting arrested for driving without a license. No okay. drug charges. And so that the jury recognizes it when they see it later, if I may just sort of share yes, that. Okay. It did, it did at the bench conference. I indicated that it was full, so. So November 22nd, you don't recall it now, but you didn't have a license then, right? No. And um, it sounds like you're saying today you were um, selling drugs in November? I don't recall. Selling drugs in December of 2019? I don't uh, Didn't you say on direct that you sold some to Adam and Kayla? I have, yes. Okay, so you were still selling drugs in December? I don't recall. So when you were telling the state that you sold drugs to Kayla and Adam, are you saying that was not in December? 
I'm not saying that. When you said that, you weren't necessarily talking about December of 2019 when you told the state you were selling them drugs. Say, let me repeat that. Okay. Were you selling them drugs around the time that they stayed in your Audi? I don't think no. I don't. Okay. Not that. Not that weekend. I can't say I sold them drugs that weekend. No, I know I didn't sell them drugs that weekend. You know you didn't sell drugs that weekend. No. You can remember that clearly. I kind of. I'm pretty sure I remember that. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, let's talk about those food stamps. Those food stamps. Didn't that? Um, they sell you some food stamps when they were in. Uh, Kayla's mother's home? I don't know where they were at. I just bought the food stamps. Okay. About when they were at the fit shelter. Okay. I probably did. I don't know where they were at when I, where they, I didn't go, I don't remember where I went to see them for them to give me the card. Okay. Uh, your uh, Audi had a clutch, right? Yes. And, um, the problem with the clutch, if somebody turns on the battery without turning on the car, the battery just runs down. Yes. And um, otherwise you have to put in the clutch and have it in neutral or whatever and turn it on and keep it in neutral and then it can run for a long time and the heat stays on. Yes, right? yes. And Kayla didn't seem to know that and the car broke down. Yes. Well, the car battery died. Battery died. Okay. And, um, okay. You said that the picture of your car uh, was in this same condition and it states exhibit for ID 22. Is it stricken? It's fine. If I would agree if it wasn't. Um, was in the same condition as the last time you saw it, right? Yes. Because the last time you saw it, it, it had been sitting for a while. It was worse. <laughs> it was worse. Okay. And, but when you had it at Colonial Village, it was in good condition. Yes. It was in real good condition. Very good condition. And um, you like to drive it around? I mean, I drove it, yes, not drive around. Okay, and you kept it in good condition. Yes. You took care of it, right? Yes. And in November, uh, late November, you had just been convicted of a crime. You had a suspended sentence on your head, and you didn't want to be caught driving that car without a license again, right? True. So you had other people help you drive? Sometimes. Okay. Adam was one of those other people. Uh, yeah, he has driven the car, yeah. Okay. And Adam knew how to drive a clutch, right? Yes. Okay. Cause he, and, and your clutch, because he had driven that car. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said on direct that you saw... Harmony twice at Guilford Avenue? No, one time at Guilford Avenue. And what was the other time? Before that, the day he took me to court in August. Oh, so she was in the car? Yes. Okay. And uh, with the boys? Yes. And at Guilford Avenue, she was there and playing with the boys? Yes. And um, you said that Kayla and Adam needed a place to stay Thanksgiving weekend? Yes. And when they came and told you that they needed a place to stay, you said that you would let them stay in your car for two nights? I didn't specifically say two nights. I okay. said they can stay in my vehicle, but they happen to only stay two nights. Okay. Two days, two whole days. Okay. And one of those nights, it ran out, uh, the battery got drained. From what they say, the first night, yes. Okay. And uh, 
you are saying that you did not go down and see them sort of squatting in the parking lot at Colonial Village no. in their Seabird. No, I did not. And uh, you are saying that you did not go down on a daily or every other day basis to connect with the family and see Harmony and wave to her. No. And you are saying that Harmony did not wave to you during that time. I didn't see Harmony. They didn't have Harmony with them. Pardon? They did not have Harmony with them. Okay. When? When they came to see me. On those two days or before those two days? It depends when you're talking about. Okay. Did you ever, are you saying you did sometimes go down to the car to see them? I'm pretty sure I went down a couple of times each day. Okay, okay. But each time they did not have the girl with them. It okay. was only the boys. And when you were questioned by the police, they actually played a recording of Kayla's statement, right? Uh, yes. And they played a recording of Kayla talking about So they played a section of uh, Kayla's statement, and you got pretty upset with that, right? I guess. Got pretty upset with what you were hearing. I guess, yes. And you said 
that you never saw Harmony. I never did. And that you didn't go down there. Let's go. When did I not see Harmony? You're just saying I didn't see Harmony, but where? When? At the Colonial Village. No. And that you didn't go down to the car on a daily basis. Right. Well, two days they stood in the car. I went down a, at least a couple of times each day. For two days you went down a couple of times At least day? a couple of times, yes. Those two days? Those two days. Okay. And um, you never, you're saying you never waved to Harmony? Never. Never waved to the boys? <laughs> Overruled. I'm telling you she wasn't in the car. How can I wave to someone that's not in the car? Did you wave to the boys? I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did, yeah. Okay. The boys loved me. So you would go to, when you would go down there, you would see the boys and wave? Of course. And you want to have nothing to do with this investigation or harmony, right? It's not the way you're making it sound. I want to help you guys. Who? The prosecution helped find who killed that little girl. Okay, so... One of the things before they stayed in your car was you drove Adam and Kayla and uh, the kids to get clothes out of their broken down car. I don't recall that. I don't think I ever did that. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure, but I don't recall I ever did that. Okay. Why would I? No. I wouldn't stuff my car with anything. Let's put it like that. You wouldn't know what? I would not stuff my car with a whole bunch of furniture or bags or anything like that. Okay, so bags that were from a car that people had lived in for seven days, you never got them and packed them into your car? I don't recall ever doing that. No, I okay. do not. And so you don't recall taking Adam or Kayla or Adam and Kayla or Adam and Kayla and the boys? No matter how you put it, I don't recall. Okay. And uh, the food that you brought them, you said Thanksgiving leftovers, right? Yes. And then uh, pizza. Yes. And Thanksgiving. If you uh, had them in your car for uh, around the 8th, Thanksgiving was over a week before, right? Well, of course, that would be right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thanksgiving was about 10 days before that, right? I guess. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about. And actually, you gave the family Thanksgiving leftovers when they first came to Colonial Village in the Seabring? No. You didn't give them? There was no Seabring. Okay. They stood in my car. If they had their Seabring, they would have stood in their own car, wouldn't you think? Okay. And you're saying that they did not park out in Colonial Village uh, for 10 days prior to living in your Seabring? I, didn't have, I don't own a Seabring. And if they did bring the car to the parking lot, then I didn't know that either. Okay. They telling me they have no place to live. I let them stay in my car two days. That's and I, they stood. They left. I do want to correct. I did say Sebring, and I meant the Audi. Okay. So you're saying that you did not see the Sebring in Colonial Village for the 10 days leading up to when they stayed in your Audi? I didn't see the car, no. Okay. Uh, you said that the boys loved you. Yes, had you seen do. the boys for more than those two times before? Before and after, yes. Before? Yeah. When did you see the boys before? I saw Adam came to see me one time with the with, with the oldest one. Pardon? Adam came to see me one time with the oldest one. Okay. And how about the others? I guess the other one, the other, they were with Kayla, I guess. Okay. But I'm asking, so now that's three times. No, that's not three times I saw Harmony. No. Like, okay. Don't get her confused. I'm not. I only saw her two times. I'm backing up. Okay. Okay. First time you saw Harmony, she was with her brothers. Yes. 
Second time you saw Harmony, she was with her brothers. Yes. You're talking about another time that you see the brother, but not Harmony. Yes. How many other times did you see that brother? Plenty of times. When? Throughout the, throughout the whole time I knew them. Okay. Did you see the boy prior, more than those three times that we're talking about? When do you, but when are you referring to? Before Harmony went missing or after Harmony went missing? I'm trying to get there. Before the eighth, when they stayed in your Audi, had you seen the sun more than three times? Of course. When? I can't tell you exactly when, but I've, see, I've seen the I've seen the, the boys with him with them. In the ten days prior to staying in the Audi, you saw the boys with them. I can't tell you exactly how many days prior to the, the day I let them stay in the car, but I did see them. Yeah. Okay. I seen the boys. Okay. Not the boys. Let me correct that. The boy. The boy. There was only one boy with him. And what circumstance did you see that boy? Was Kayla coming up to see you and bringing her son with her? No, Adam came to see me with the boy. Okay, so Adam would come up to see you and he'd bring his son. Yeah. Okay. And uh, did they ever come in to use the bathroom or maybe clean up their kids? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Badera. You're welcome. Mr. Badera, what's your uh, involvement been like with uh, the legal system? How, how? Been very bad, sir. I'm not going to lie. Um, Attorney Smith was just asking you about this time that the defendant came to see you with his oldest son. Yes. Do you recall when that was? I don't recall exactly when, but it was before Thanksgiving. Before Thanksgiving. Before Thanksgiving, yeah. You said that the two days they were staying in your car, that, that you remember that clearly, that you didn't sell drugs to them. You were very clear on that. Why, why is that? Because it's, it's, it's like a, it's a family weekend. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't recall selling them drugs that weekend. I don't even recall me having drugs. Mr. Badera, let me ask you this. How many times have you allowed a family to stay in your, your vehicle? I never have. That was the first time. Was that the only time? First and only time, yes. Does that stand out to you? Well, I remember, yeah. The defense asked you about letting people drive your car. You didn't have a license, mm -hmm. is my understanding. Is that right? Yes. And the defense attorney asked about letting people drive your car. I want to follow up on that. Um, you said that you'd occasionally allow folks to drive for you. Not really. I would drive myself. I ain't going to lie. I didn't have a license, but I would drive myself. Um, do you recall telling investigators that I didn't let anyone drive my car? I didn't let them drive it. Do you recall telling investigators that? I'm pretty sure I did, yeah. The them that you were referring to, is that the defendant and Kayla? Well, I wouldn't lend them my car if that's what they were. I don't know what y'all are really trying to say by that, but I would never have lent them my car. Yeah, he. I, I recall a time he drove me somewhere in my own car, yes. But I've never lent him my car to just be on their own and drive my car. And the time that you're talking about where you lent him your car, I don't even recall, sir. Do you recall whether there was snow on the ground, whether it was hot or warm outside? I don't. I don't remember any, any of that. You mentioned seeing the two boys. Yes. And, and them waving at you, you waving back. 
were you referring to the two days that they were staying in your that the boys were staying in your vehicle or was that some other time actually yeah, uh, that was some other time i was just whenever they saw me they waved to me they they said hi i would grab them hug them I can't recall every time they said they waved to me. That's what all kids do. They say hi. So Adam did drive you around in your car, but you don't recall exactly when. Of course, because it wasn't on a regular basis. But it was more than once. I can't even say that. I don't even recall that. I okay. Think, I'm thinking it was only one time. So. Okay. And uh, when you interacted with the boys, it wasn't just waving. I think you'd say that they came up of and course. they would hug you. Yes. yes. So uh, it wasn't just a wave from afar. If the kids were around, I you came up to them and interacted. All the time. Okay. <coughs> no further questions. You may sit down. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I just would ask that this witness be excused. Any objection is being excused? I'd rather not, no. You may sit down, but you remain under subpoena, sir. The state will explain that to you. Yes, and I think it's probably, it's just about 2.30, ladies and gentlemen, so it's a good time for our mid-afternoon break, so we'll take 15 minutes. All rise for the jurors, please. Don't discuss the case. Don't do any independent research, please. Please come back uh, a couple minutes before quarter of, please. She did say she wanted to end a little early for the monitor.
ready? Mm. Yes. We can bring them in. All rise for the jurors, please. May be seated. State may call its next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. At this point, the state will call Officer Ryan Heil to the stand. Please. Thank you. Uh, if you would please uh, go right up to the bailiff, watch your foot on the cords over there. Take the stand, please. Detective, if you would remain standing just for a moment, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Please feel free to have a seat. Since we're being recorded here for the day, would you please state your full name and spell both your first and last name for the record? Yes. Ryan Heil, R-Y-A-N-H-E-I-L-E. -E. Okay. And Detective Heil, where are you currently employed? The Manchester Police Department. How long have you been working for the Manchester Police Department? Since April 2013. 2013, so Correct. Uh, a little over 10 years then? Yes. Okay. And let me ask you, um, are you a full-time certified police officer with them? I am. Okay. Um, did you graduate from the New Hampshire State Police Training Academy? I did. And when did you graduate from there? The summer of 2013. Okay. Uh, do you remember your academy class? 151. And let me ask you, in your time at the uh, Manchester Police Department, first of all, did you have any law enforcement experience before you started working at Manchester? I was part-time in Southampton, New Hampshire for about a year prior. For about one year? Correct. Okay. Since you've been with Manchester, can you please describe for the jury some of the different patrols that you've been on, different units and assignments that you've had, basically your different, your different job duties for the department? Okay. So when I graduated until September 2018, I was in patrol. In September 2018, I was assigned to Detective. That's, I'm sorry, did you say September or December? Uh, September. September 2018, okay. With regards to that time period of being a detective, uh, what are some of your duties that you do right now? This, so my specialty is, is fire-related, but I also deal with anything that is uh, adult-related. As opposed to what, when you say adult-related? So either juvenile or domestic violence, my, spe uh, my area is the adult side. Okay. Uh, back in specifically January of 2022, uh, were you working as a detective then? I was. Okay. And doing the same sort of crimes involving adults? That is correct. <clears throat> in uh, January of 2002, were you involved and in a part of a search that was done specifically of a 2006 Audi S4 with New Hampshire registration 4569334? I was. Okay. Where did that search get, where was that taking place? In the, our evidence bay in our secure lot of the Manchester Police Department. And what was your role in the search of that car? So, um, so I type up what we call a crime scene note, which basically documents everything that took place during the search. And what were some of the challenges uh, that you and the other officers faced while trying to process that particular car? It, um, it was a very biohazard um, conditions. Since there was, the vehicle was covered in mold, we actually had to wear a Tyvek suit and a full face mask respirator during the search of this car. And Detective, I'm just moving the microphone for a moment. I'd like to uh, show you what's been marked State's Exhibit 22. Do you recognize this car? I do. Okay, what do you recognize that to be? That is the car that I searched. Um, could you go ahead and just for a moment, please? Um, what are we looking at that's all over the front of this car? 
um, leaves, dead um, pieces of trees, twigs. And where was the biohazard that you had to deal with when you were processing this car? All inside, the complete interior of the car. I'd like to show you what's been marked Stig's Exhibit 23 for identification purposes only. Just have you take that down there. For okay. Me. And do you recognize that photo? I do. What's that a photo of? That's the interior of the Audi that was searched. Uh, does that accurately reflect what you just told us with regards to the condition of the car when you searched it? It does. And also, I'm going to show you Stig's Exhibit 24 for identification purposes only. And I wonder if you could take a look at that photo. That is also the interior version in the trunk of the vehicle that was searched. The trunk of that Audi S4? That is correct. Does that photo accurately depict the condition, the same one that you saw when you were part of that search back in January of 2022? It is. Other than the fact that both of those photos had small little red labels down on the corners, have there been any other sort of changes or alterations with regards to that photo based upon your memory of what that, look, that image looked like on that day? No. At this point, Your Honor, I'd ask for identification to be stricken from States Exhibits 23 and 24. Without objection. The ID is stricken, not 22, just. Oh, you already have 22, 22 is already, already full. Yes, okay. The ID is stricken on uh, exhibits 23 and 24. They're entered as full exhibits. Mr. Hall, I'm going to go ahead and show you states and permission to Your Honor. Yes. I'm going to show you the state's exhibit 23, this particular one. Again, what part of the car is this? That is the interior front of the vehicle that was searched. Interior and the front? Yes. Okay. Um, you said that you had to wear Tyvek suits. Um, with regards to the interior, what was the interior color supposed to be? It was a lighter color. A lighter color? Yes. Okay. Can you, is, uh, any particular color, like gray, like tan? I believe it was a creamish color. Kind of a cream color. Okay. So, with regards to the color that we're seeing on the seats, what's that on the seats here? That is, I believe, it's mold. Also showing uh, States Exhibit 24. You said this is the trunk photo, correct? Yes, sir. With regards to this photo, do you, uh, do you recall was this the condition of the trunk when you guys opened the trunk, or were there other items that have been taken out? Of this? There was a large amount of items that were removed prior to that photograph. A large amount? That is correct. Okay. What kind of items are we talking about that you find inside this car? Uh, it was a large array. It was a lot of um, household items, um, towels, clothes, masks, like uh, COVID masks. COVID masks? Yes. Nonetheless, did you and the other officers still try to process that vehicle? We did, yes. Okay. And how did you go about doing it with a vehicle that looked like that? Um, so so at, all of our skin was covered up just because of the biohazard conditions of that car. We did a very slow search of the vehicle. We, what we, we did it is we did seat by seat, so make sure we did not miss anything in the car itself. And uh, from that, were there a number of items that were taken and placed into evidence that day, taken out of that car? Yes, there was. And in the end, were you yourself able to determine whether any of those items had any relevance to the disappearance of Harmony Montgomery? I Just based on your own knowledge? No, I did not know that. Okay. And with regards to those particular items that were taken out of that car, uh, where did they go when they left the evidence bay, or excuse me, the uh, garage bay where you were working on the car? They would have got secured at the evidence, which is on the second floor of the Manchester Police Department. So we were on, on the ground level, and it would have gone up to the second floor and been secured that way. Um, are you aware that some of the evidence in this case, uh, in general, was taken down to a place called DNA Labs International in Deerfield Park, Florida? Yes. And how are you aware of that? I was one of the detectives actually had brought some of the evidence back once it was finished being processed from Florida. Did that include any large pieces of evidence? Yes, it did. Okay. Can you, do you recall what those large pieces of evidence were? And by large, I mean physical. Yes. It was a ceiling tile was one of the items. How big was it? We got a, a full-size SUV, and if you laid it flat, it barely fit in the back seat of the SUV laying flat. 
So it was, it was very large. Um, was there any other sort of large items that came back from that particular lab after testing? Yes. What else? We, we brought three, three different pieces of evidence back. Not all were, were involved in this case, but also some were, were railings that were part of the ceiling tile that was wrapped up and placed in a bag. And with regards to getting those back from Florida, can you just describe for the jury how those came back and how you were a part of that? So, uh, so myself and Detective Scott Riley actually drove from South Florida all the way back up here in, in the SUV with all the items with us. While driving with those items, uh, did you ensure that they were not left alone at any time during that drive? That is correct. It was secured in our possession the whole time. Let me just have a moment, Your Honor. <coughs> Detective Heil, thank you very much for your time. I don't have any further questions for you. I believe defense counsel may have a few. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. And good afternoon to you. My name is Jamie Brooks. Good afternoon, sir. I just want to make sure I heard this right. So uh, June 29th of last year, you picked up some evidentiary items pertaining to this case from uh, a DNA lab office in Florida, correct? That is correct. Did you also pick up items belonging to a separate case? There was multiple cases that we're picking up items for, yes. So when this kind of a trip is made, I'm taking it's not that often, uh, it's kind of like one-stop shopping, you'll just pick up everything that's, that's ready to be brought back? Yes. Thank you. Just one question, Your Honor. With, to your knowledge, Detective, how many times has a trip like this been done to DNA Labs International? It's the first time that I've been made aware of it. Thank you. That's all, Your Honor. Anything further, Attorney Brooks? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may sit down. Thank you, Mayor. Your Honor, at this time, the state would call Ms. Christina Lubin to the stand. Ms. Lubin, if you would please remain standing for a moment and please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please feel free to have a seat. Ms. Lubin, as we're being recorded here today, would you please go ahead, state your full name, and then spell both your first and your last name for the record. Christina Lubin, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-L-U-B-I-N. And Ms. Lubin, what town do you live in? Manchester. How long have you lived here? 24 years. And are you working right now? I'm self-employed. Okay. And what are some of the things that you do being self-employed? Um, deliveries, flipping furniture, and a hired-in server. Okay. And in addition to living here in Manchester, uh, is your residence currently on Dubuque Street? Yes. And let me ask you, do you have a daughter? Yes. And what's her name? Kayla Montgomery. Do you know someone by the name of Adam Montgomery? Yes. Who was he? My daughter's husband. Do you also know someone by the name of Harmony Montgomery? Yes. Who is she? Adam's daughter. This yes, I do. Who is this? Adam Montgomery. When did you first meet Harmony? 
It was shortly after um, Thanksgiving in 2019. So you only got to know her for a small time? One time, yes. One time. Where did you see her? At my house. And I believe you said it was right around Thanksgiving. Is that appropriate? It was shortly after Thanksgiving, yes. Uh, to your knowledge, was that before or after uh, they got evicted from 77 Guilford Street? I believe that's after they got evicted. So we've been beginning in the winter, December of 2019. At some point, did you receive a phone call from your daughter? I spoke to her a couple times. I'm not sure exactly which particular one you're... Let me be more specific. At some point, um, did, uh, did you ever see her and Adam and the two boys at your house, but not with Harmony? Yes. And when did that occur in December of 2019? That was, I, it was before December. Um, it was shortly after Thanksgiving because I had just put my tree up. And I don't remember the exact date. I just remember shutting off the overhead lights so that the kids could see the Christmas lights and the ornaments. Okay. And that's when you saw Harmony that that's time? That's when I saw Harmony. Okay. Um, later in the month, uh, did they come back to stay with you, I'm sorry, uh, for a longer period of time than just one afternoon? Yes. Okay. And when they came the second time, was Harmony still there? No, she wasn't. When did you find out that they had been evicted from 77 Guilford Street? Um, Kayla had called me at one point before seeing them at my house mm -hmm. about having a flat tire and needing money for it. Um, so I, I was leaving to leave for the day. So I left them money in a cooler in my um, side hallway so that they could get their tire fixed. You left the money in a cooler? Yes. Could you describe what, what did the cooler look like? It was a red cooler with a white top that would flip open. Um, later on, when you saw them next in December, um, I believe you testified a moment ago that they did not have harmony at that point. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, where did you first see them and how did they get to your house that day? I picked them up at my sister's house. Um, they... Um, went there because they had no place to go. I guess their car broke down at that point, um, and they had they had nowhere to, to go. Okay. My sister said they well, definitely Hold on just a second. I, I don't want to necessarily ask you what somebody else said okay. at this point, but I, I appreciate that. Uh, let me ask a few more questions about what you just told us, though. Uh, you stated that you picked them up. Uh, what kind of car were you driving? I had a green minivan, a Ford minivan. Okay. So were you able to fit uh, your daughter... Adam Montgomery and the boys in that minivan? Yes. Uh, did they have anything else with them? Did they have any luggage with them? It was, they had some bags with them. Um, I don't remember exactly what. Um, this second time when they were there without Harmony, uh, did you ask Adam Montgomery where Harmony was? I asked Kayla. You asked Kayla. Um, once they were there with you. How long did they stay before they moved on? They were there a couple of weeks. I think it was like December 29th, 30th, um, right around then. Do you know where they moved to when they left you? They went to FIT in Manchester. And FIT, is that short for the Families in Transition Shelter? Yes. When they were spending time with you, if you could just... Uh, go a little bit into detail for us to explain um, your particular apartment in your building. How, if I were to come visit, how would I be able to get inside your apartment? What are the doors and where are they? There, there are three doors mm -hmm. to my apartment. I'm the full bottom floor. The very front door facing on Dubuque Street is where the mailboxes are and that door is always locked. There's a middle door to the left hand side next to a tree and that's the side door that the, I have a door to my apartment there. Mm -hmm. And the people that live on the second and third floor use that door to go up and down the stairs. Then there's a back door where I park my car and that's the door that I use as my main entrance. Um, when you said before that you had left money for the family um, and you had left it in a cooler, 
Um, where was that cooler located in relation to these three doors you just explained? The middle door that's next to the tree. That's next to the tree? Yeah. So that's the middle door. And you mean the tree outside, not a Christmas right. tree, I right. take it. Okay. Yes. Um, that particular hallway, the door in and out of that hallway, um, is that, first of all, is that a hallway that's just yours, or is that a common hallway that other people can use to go up and down That's a common hallway. Common hallway. And the cooler, was that stored inside a locked part of your apartment, or was that out in the common hallway? That was out in the common hallway. Okay. When they stayed with you for those couple of weeks in December, um, what doorway did they come into your apartment? Did they go in from the back one that you described for yourself or from that common hallway? They went through the common hallway. And did they have a car with them while you were there? Did you see that they owned a car at that point? In December, no, I didn't see a car. They didn't have a car. You stated that your uh, apartment's on the, f on the ground floor. Um, is that a first floor or is this a, like a basement apartment? No, it's the first floor. First floor, got it. And that hallway, what else is in that common hallway uh, besides your cooler that you stored there? There's um, a door that goes to the basement that's paddle locked. There's my there's an entrance to my apartment that goes to my dining room, mm -hmm. and then there's the stairs to the second and third floor. Uh, the door down to the basement, um, I believe, is that locked? Or not yes, locked? that's the locked one. How long had you owned that red cooler uh, in the hallway? A couple of years. I used it for basketball the basketball team. Uh, did you always store it in the hallway? No, sometimes it was in the apartment, sometimes it was in the hall. A lot of, most of the time it was in the hall when basketball was all done. You said a moment ago that you left money in the, in the past there for, for Kayla and for, for the defendant. Um, was the cooler in the hallway when you did that? Yes. And how would you leave that money so that somebody else wouldn't take it? So it was next to my apartment door um, at the end of the hallway and I would put money under a piece of cardboard and then close the cover. So the cardboard was inside the cooler? Yes. Two minutes. <clears throat> I'd like to go ahead and show you what's been marked States Exhibit 28 for identification purposes only at this point in time. Uh, do you recognize the object in that photo? Yes. And what is that object? That's the red cooler from my apartment. And I'd like to also show you States Exhibit 29. Uh, actually, and you said that's the cooler in your apartment. Is that generally in the same condition as you would keep it? it hasn't been scratched up or marked or anything else at that point. Yes, it looks a little bit dirty. A little but, dirty? Yeah. I'm not going to show you what's been marked State's Exhibit 29 for identification purposes at home, but um, is that still the same cooler? It looks like the same cooler. Okay. And can I ask, uh, what are, are there any other differences that you see with regards to that cooler from how we just looked at it a moment ago versus how you're looking at it there? It looks really dirty. Okay. And do you see any stickers that have been placed on there? Yes, I do. But still the same cooler? It looks like the same cooler. Ron, at this point, the state's going to ask for identification to be stricken from State's Exhibit 28. No objection. Right, the ID is stricken on Exhibit 28. It's entered as a full exhibit. That cooler that we just looked at, that was your cooler that was in the hall? It looks like my cooler, yes. And 
that was there back in December of 2019? Yes. States Exhibit 77 for identification purposes. What I would like to do is I would like to open up the top of the packaging so that you can see it and then ask whether or not you can identify the object. Okay. Okay. I wonder if I may borrow the scissors again. you would leave money in? Yes. Did you ever keep anything else in this cooler? I used it for basketball tournaments, for food. For food, for mm -hmm. basketball tournaments. At some point, did police come to see you at your home to ask you questions about Harmony's disappearance? Yes. Later on, did you agree and allow them to do a search of your home uh, for, relative to that investigation? Yes, I don't remember them actually searching the home, okay. um, but they were free to come in and do whatever they like. And let me ask you, did they take that cooler from you when you met with them on one occasion? Yes. Did they explain to you why that they took the cooler or no? Not really a, any detail, they just needed it. Okay. Do you know why they took the cooler? I had a suspicion. What was your suspicion? I know they were looking for speculation. I'll withdraw the question, Your Honor. Objection is sustained. Ms. Lubin, one thing I do want to make clear, uh, other than the money and the food that you had before for basketball games and um, other than the money that you left for Kayla, do you have any idea what else was kept in, inside no. this cooler? No. Did Adam Montgomery ever talk to you about this cooler? Never. It's my understanding that uh, you do some woodworking? Yes. What do you do? I upcycle and recycle pretty much any furniture I can get my hands on. Any I have a table saw, I have a circular saw, I have a band saw, I have a sill saw. Sill saw, what kind of saw is that? Um, it's a saw that I use to cut pallet, not go through the um, nails on pallet wood. 
It's like a hand. It's a handle and it's got long blades that you can put in it. Um, long blades? How long? Um, well, the blade itself's like this big, and then you have the end piece that attaches inside the machine. And how does that saw operate? <laughs> It's about yay big. Is it round or is it? No, it's like a, just a long blade about this thick, okay. and it kind of go vibrates back and forth as so it. I'm assuming you hold your hands up to be what maybe about an inch thick. Is that about right? Yeah, maybe uh, almost an inch. Almost an inch. Jigsaw. Um, do you have a, um, a miter saw or a chop saw? Do you think I do have a miter saw, yes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you what's been marked stakes as if it's 63. Do you have a grinder? No. You don't own a grinder? No, I don't own a grinder. And uh, how long have you been doing woodworking? About six years. Six years or so? Mm hmm. Fair to say you've got a lot of different tools for those jobs. Mm -hmm. working. Yes. And a grinder is not one of them. No. Let me just have a moment. Clarification, Your Honor. I apologize. I referred to the cooler as Exhibit 77. It's Exhibit 73. So I apologize for that mistake. And that, Ms. Lubin, I don't have any further questions for you. I thank you very much for your time. I believe Defense Counsel may have a few. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Caroline Smith, and I do have a few questions for you. And let's start with the tools, okay? Um, where do you keep your tools? Um, I have some by the back door. Um, on a rack, and then I have some put away in um, a little storage unit that I made that's on wheels in my off the side of the dining room area. Okay, so that's in your apartment. Some are in the apartment, some are out? No, they're both in the apartment, just different locations in the apartment. Okay. I've had to move them around. Okay, and the basement, um, is that something anybody has access to? No, well, the tenants have access to it because we each have a key. Okay. Because um, it's paddle locked, but it's not anything that we use or use to store anything. Or. Okay. And I said I'd get to the tools, so I'll get to the tools first. Um, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit H. Okay. Do you recognize what kind of tool this is? That's a miter saw. And that's one of the tools that you have, right? Yes. And did you say that you had a circular saw? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you a copy of... Can you tell me what kind of tool is in this image? That is a circular saw. Okay. I'm going to show you the jury. place and where Kayla, Adam, and the kids stayed. Were they in your apartment? Yes. Did you have an extra spare room for them? Not for them. That was packed full with furniture flipping and tools. Okay. So it was a room that you had available that you let them use for a while, but it wasn't a room that you had intended for them. 
they didn't really use the room. They just put their items in there, their clothes in there, and they slept on the pull-out couch in the living room. Okay. All right. So all the kids are, and the family is all together. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just to get a better idea and the jury to when you, of your house, you're on the first floor. Yes. And if you're on Dubuque Street, uh, if you look at the right side of the building, but facing Dubuque Street is a door. Yes. And then you've got a um, arched window beside that door. Yes. And then on the other side, there's a sidewalk that goes along the side. Yes. And I think that you said that there was a door in the middle of the building along that sidewalk. Yes. And then in the back of the building, there's another door. Yes. And you use the front door? No. You use the side door along the sidewalk? No. You use the back door? Yes. Uh, okay. And that, that you park there? Yes. Okay. So you drive around back of the building, you park, and you can come in the back way. Yes. Do you have the whole downstairs? The whole floor, yes. Okay. So um, any door that you go in, you can access your place? Yes. You don't necessarily, but you right. can. So the middle door, where did you say that um, Adam and Kayla and the kids would go in? The middle door. The middle door along the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the front door would be for tenants going upstairs or something? They would use the middle door. Okay. Front door was for show? The front door, you go out and get your mail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, now I want to talk about when you met Harmony. And um, you recall that visit, right? Yes. And you even recalled what she was wearing, right? No, I don't recall what she was wearing. Okay. I'm going to show you a copy of a report that um, I believe that you were given to review okay. prior to your testimony. And um, do you remember meeting with the state about uh, your prior testimony? Yes. And uh, you reviewed the report that they asked you to review? I remember reviewing it, yes. Okay. And you said that it was accurate? Yes. Okay. If I show you a copy of that report, will that help refresh your recollection of if at some point you remembered what she was wearing? Yes. It's been a chaotic couple of years, huh? Yes. Okay. Okay. that page 165 that they gave you and you can read any of this report about you but I'm going to ask specifically about uh, okay. what you told them there. Okay, I, I just read that part. Okay. And um, do you recall that you remembered then that she was wearing a pink jacket? I, still, my, I don't really remember what she was wearing, like, visually. I, I, I remember this. I remember everything else in there, but I don't really remember a fuzzy coat. Okay. I didn't say anything about pink. And pigtails? Yes, I remember the pigtails. Okay. And glasses? And glasses. Um, and... You remember that because you were paying attention to her, right? She was next to me in the living room. Okay. So you were able to see her face? Yes. And she was adorable? Yes. And uh, you enjoyed meeting her and trying to get to know her? She didn't talk much, and they were there very briefly. Okay. And um, I believe that you said uh, she looked healthy? Yes, she did. Okay, and she was 
pleasant, didn't talk much, but seemed fine. She seemed fine, yes. Okay. Thank you. No, f I'm sorry, no further questions. No, I do not have a grinder. So, uh, haven't owned one in the past either. Never. So, if somebody saw one new in a box, it wasn't yours. No. No. Thank you. Further questions? Really? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Pim. Thank you. At this point, the state would call criminalist Katie Swango to the stand, please. Sorry, Ms. Wango, for the courts. I apologize. Uh, thank you very much for being here. If you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you. Please feel free to have a seat. And as we're being recorded here today, would you please go ahead, state your full name, and spell both your first and last name for the record. Katie Lynn Swango. Katie, K-A-T-I-E, Swango, S-W-A-N-G-O. Uh, thank you very much. And Ms. Winkle, where are you currently employed? I work for the New Hampshire State Police in the Forensic Laboratory. How long have you worked for them? Um, next month will be 16 years. 16 years? Yes. Okay. Um, where did you first begin work as a criminalist? I worked at the California Department of Justice in Richmond, California in their laboratory. How long did you work out in California? Uh, just over six years, I think it was. Six years and a couple months. Six years and a couple months. Okay. What did you specialize in when you were working in California? So when I started there, I was actually working in their method development unit, but the whole lab that I worked in was all still forensic DNA. But I was in method development, um, I, which is just testing methods to see if you can do things faster, cheaper, better than whatever the... the caseworkers are doing then mm -hmm. and then I entered a training program to be an actual forensic DNA case analyst um, when that was over I was an analyst for about a year there before I moved to New Hampshire and when you moved to New Hampshire and I take it at that point did you start working for New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory was that your first job when moving into New Hampshire yes I moved here specifically for the job and uh, what position did you start at for them the same position I'm in right now, a criminalist too. Okay. Um, so with regards to that, what unit do you work in inside the State Police Forensic Lab? Forensic Biology. And could you just please for a brief moment explain to the jury what the different units are at the State Police Forensic Lab? Sure. So uh, the lab has a lot of different um, services that we offer. So there's um, fingerprints, there's controlled drugs, there's toxicology, um, there's digital evidence, so there are many different sections, one of them being the forensic biology unit. 
And um, what sort of background do you have to have in training? First of all, let's talk about education, I guess. What kind of edu education do you have to have to work as a criminalist too and to work in the forensic biology unit? So to work in um, the lab in general, you have to have uh, a bachelor's of science degree. Um, in, but to be in DNA specifically, to be an analyst within in the U.S., to be a DNA analyst, you need to have specific classes in, on, a, on top of a Bachelor of Science degree. And, and the Bachelor of Science has to be in a science, chemistry, biology, forensic science, um, something like that. But the classes that you have to have specifically for DNA is to have, you have to have microbiology or molecular biology, you have to have statistics, um, genetics, and biochemistry. So for your own educational degrees, I take it you obviously meet the bachelor's requirement, but uh, what other degrees do you have? Right. I also have a PhD in human genetics. I'm sorry, in what? Human genetics. Okay. Um, sorry, the, I'm trying to stand close to the microphone myself, so if you could just scoot in a little bit close to the microphone, I'd appreciate that. Um, and what are some of your current duties inside the unit? What do you do right now for them? So I am a, a DNA analyst for the casework. So that means that I will do DNA cases. I also um, work or am trained to work in another section of the forensic biology unit, which we call serology. That is identifying body fluids on evidence. So I work in those two sections within the unit. I write my own reports. I review other people's work. I train other people. Um, and I go to court. <laughs> okay. Do you, so I take it then that your duties do include the analysis and the comparison of different DNA samples? Yes. Could you please describe, um, I believe you talked a little bit about some of the additional training that you need and qualifications, but what sort of training and qualifications uh, did you gain to be able to make those comparisons between different DNA samples? So that's all part of when you're training to be a caseworker, both back when I was in California <coughs> as well as here. That's uh, we take classes, you have on-the-job training, um, and that's all teaching you how to follow the guidelines that are recommended for DNA testing in the U.S. Do you have any continuing education requirements? Once you get your degrees, do you have to keep doing other coursework to be certified? Yes. To, be, to remain an analyst in the U.S., you have to have a minimum of eight hours of continuing education every year that's specific to DNA. Um, generally, we go to conferences, so it's a couple days. It's not just the eight hours, but um, it can be just eight hours, but it's a minimum of eight hours a year. So between your seven years in California and your 13 years here um, in New Hampshire, um, would, when you add those together, how many DNA profiles would you say that you've analyzed over your career so far? Thousands. Just thousands. Right. I don't have a specific number, but thousands of samples. Have you ever been qualified in court as an expert in the area of DNA analysis and testing? Yes, I have. About how many times? Around 40. And with regards to those qualifications of those, excuse me, being qualified as an expert, has that occurred here in the state of New Hampshire? Yes. Most of the times, I think only two were in California, so around 38 times here. 38 times here in New Hampshire? Yes. And does that include here in Hillsborough County in the Northern District? Yes. Uh, at this point, Your Honor, we would ask that criminal Swango be qualified as an expert in the field of DNA analysis. Any objection? I have no objection to her giving her opinion. And I find her so qualified. Thank you, Your Honor. So, uh, criminal Swango, if you could explain a little bit about DNA. Everybody's seen a lot of things on TV and the news, um, but uh, courtroom is not necessarily like they put things on TV or in the news. Or, excuse me, uh, TV or in movies. Can you just explain for us what is DNA, where does it come from, and how does it play a role in your work? So, DNA is what we kind of hear as the blueprint of our of our bodies. It's what makes us a human instead of an animal or a plant or something like that. Uh, we get our DNA from half from your mom, half from your dad. We can find it in any cell in your body except a red blood cell. Um, everybody has different DNA in their body and, except identical twins. So if there's an identical twin, they'll have identical DNA, but everyone else will have a different profile. Um, as I said, it's in, in all the cells in your body, which is why it's helpful in 
a case like this or not just this kind of case but forensics in general um, because everybody's profile is unique except identical twins if we can find a body fluid or cells from a person um, we can identify who that's from usually if i could ask a, a quick follow-up to that you stated that uh, dna cannot be found inside red blood cells so how is it then that dna can be found in a blood sample from somebody or a blood swab even if it's not in the red blood cells themselves because there's a lot of other cells in your blood. So blood isn't just red blood cells. It's got platelets, it's got white blood cells um, and other, uh, other components of your floating around in your blood. So yes, if we were swabbing literally just red blood cells, we wouldn't necessarily get a profile, but we're not that we're getting the whole component of the blood and that's what we're getting the DNA from. What part of the DNA do you look at when you're gonna go ahead and kind of process and develop a DNA profile? So we're looking at, um, so every cell has a nucleus inside, and that is the DNA that we're looking at, the DNA in the nucleus. Um, we're not, um, we're not, uh, sorry, sequencing. We're not sequencing your DNA. We're not trying to get like all of your DNA. We're looking at certain regions of the DNA that scientists have found are um, not linked to any certain diseases or anything. So we can't look at the profile and know what someone looks like. We can't tell if they have some sort of medical history. We can't tell anything like that. These are just parts of the DNA that for some reason that we don't know um, through time have developed such that they're different from person to person, but they don't have some sort of, um, they don't actually cause anything in particular. They don't cause um, anything to be wrong with people necessarily. It's just that they're different from person to person. What's the purpose then of comparing DNA? I mean, how is it really used in forensic work? So we will get DNA from an item of evidence at a scene, um, and that's where we get one profile from. And then to know whose it is, we have to have known samples from other from people that they think might be players in the scene. And we would um, take the profile from each person, we would look at them side by side, and you can just look down um, in like a tabular format at the profiles to tell if they um, match or if they're similar and could be from the same person. And then we, step, we have to um, tell them how, how strong of a match that is or, or how, um, how close those profiles could be. And so we do a statistic to provide that information as well. So, and I wanna make sure I'm getting it right. So you can develop a profile uh, of an individual, either something that's not known. Uh, so for example, a, 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 a part a DNA that's found in a location, maybe on a podium, and then compare that to a known profile of somebody from a known sample. Um, how do you get those known samples? Uh, they have to be submitted by the police department. Okay. Um, if you were to take a known sample from me right now, what are some of the different ways that you could do that? Uh, the way that is easiest and what usually we do is we take what's called a buckle swab. So it's just a long swab on a stick. So it's kind of like a Q-tip, but whereas a Q-tip is double-ended, it's just got one end that's cotton and it's got a long stick, maybe about six inches long. We would swab the inside of your mouth or give it to you to swab the inside of your mouth. Um, and that's what we would collect and it's called a buckle swab. Um, could you also be able to develop a profile from somebody's blood if you know whose blood it is? Absolutely. Uh, that used to be what people did, um, is we would have, but you'd have to have a phlebotomist, and it's a lot more invasive for a person, so it's just easier to get the buckle swabs. But we can, we could get it from any body fluid if it was, if they know it's from a certain person because they can see it being collected from that person. We could use it. It's just the buckle swab is easiest. As long as it has cells from a person, I take yes. it. Yes. Okay. Um, did you conduct any DNA analysis in this case, either of something where you didn't know who it was from at the beginning or whether it was a, a known profile, you knew who provided the sample? I did. Okay. And what known DNA samples uh, did you have for this case? What are the knowns that you were working with? I had uh, two known samples. I believe they were both buckle swabs. Uh, one was from... Adam Montgomery and one was from Crystal Sori. So one from an Adam Montgomery and one from Crystal Sori. Yes. Okay. Um, did you obtain a profile for 
a Missouri from the known swab that you had? Yes. And did you obtain a profile for Adam Montgomery from the swab that you had? Yes. Um, were you, from looking at those two, you now had two fully known profiles. So if I were to put these two side by side, I take it they would not look similar to one another. No, they wouldn't because, as we said, everybody is going to have a different profile. Okay. How many pieces of evidence did you then compare to the known profiles that you had for Crystal Sori and for Adam Montgomery? I would have to check my reports. I don't think I ended up with that. I, I had at least one, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I had more than one. I don't believe I had more than one to compare with either of them. Um, the reports that you wrote in this particular case, I want to make sure that I have an understanding. Um, did you do a report on January 19th of 2022, February 21st of 2020, excuse me, January 29th of 2022, apologize, let me get these in order. January 1st of 2022, February 1st of 2022, February 21st of 2023, and June 29th of 2022. Uh, those, Better I know yet. I wrote several reports. I would have to see them to know if those are the correct dates. And so, uh, if I may approach, Your Honor. Is it me? About how many reports do you write per year? I'd say maybe 60 maybe a year, 60. something like that. And do you review other people's reports as well for accuracy? I do. I'm going to show you a series of documents that I've shown defense counsel. I apologize. I'm going to go ahead and let you take a look over it and just let me know uh, when you're done. Yes, they all look like my reports and um, that from looking at the items, that looks like the right number of reports as well. With regards to those items, I'm going to have you hold on to those just for right now. Feel free to turn them upside down if you would and thank you to refresh your recollection with regards to specifics on this case. Just let us know. Okay. And we'll be able to do that either myself or defense counsel. Okay. Specifically, one of the things that I would like to ask you is with regards to the number of, um, the, you had these two known profiles, one for Crystal Sorry, one for Adam Montgomery, but the number of different things that you compared those to, your unknowns, if you were. I'm wondering if you could tell us how many different swabs or cuttings or items that you compared your two knowns to. As I said, I know that there was one item that I compared them both to mm -hmm. and was able to provide statistics. Okay. I did not actually get um, comparable profiles for most of the other items that I tested. And let's talk about that. When you say comparable profiles for the other items that you tested, um, from those other items, what were their test results? So a lot of the items that I got, we uh, either I, there wasn't enough DNA, so it was below the level of detection in our um, methods, or uh, there was at least one that had DNA from more than two people. We don't have methods in our lab to do to um, look at mixtures of more than two people. So that was something again that I couldn't compare to anyone. And sometimes there's just there's DNA there. It's detected, but there's not enough that would. Um, so for us to make a comparison, the profile has to be of a certain quality. And so we would we would get the profile. We would look at it, we would do a statistic on the profile to see how rare or common it would be in the population. If it doesn't meet a certain threshold, we say that it just isn't able to be compared. It's uh, too little DNA 
to compare to anybody. And so that's what happened with most of the samples that I tested in this case, unfortunately. So if I'm understanding that clearly, so most of the samples that you did test, there just either wasn't enough there or it didn't meet enough thresholds that you can definitively say, aha, I've got a DNA profile here. Correct. Correct. That's following our protocols in the laboratory. That That's how most of them panned out in this case, yes. And what to generate those profiles, even in the one item that you said that you could or the ones that you couldn't, what are the four steps that you go through to basically get and try to create a DNA profile from a swab or from an item? Okay. Um, so, I'm not, and we don't create them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Creating makes, makes it sound like I we're apologize. making them. I B- apologize. To be able to see if there's sufficient uh, information there to generate a profile. Not generate, excuse me. That's I want to make sure I'm using your language. You tell us the right yes. words okay. to say. So, <clears throat> the first step that we have is we're going to take our item of evidence and cut a piece into a tube, and we're going to put some, some um, buffers and chemicals in there, and we're going to try to break apart the cells. And the purpose of that is to get the DNA out of the cell because we can't do anything with it if it's still within the cells. And that step is called extraction. We're extracting the DNA just like you would extract juice or (coughs) anything else that um, you would have an extract. So we're going to extract the DNA out of the cells. Then once you have the DNA, we need to figure out how much we have because we've, through validations, looked at our methods and we know how much DNA is ideal for downstream. So if we have too much DNA, our equipment isn't gonna work properly. If we don't have enough DNA, it's not gonna give an ideal profile. We might not get any profile. So we need to know about how much DNA we have so that we can decide if we have to um, dilute it before we go on, because we don't wanna have too much that it doesn't work. Um, And of course, uh, if if we have methods online or depending upon um, how we do our extraction if we need to concentrate um, a sample and if that's possible. So our next step then is how figuring out how much DNA we have and that is called quantitation. We're figuring out the quantity, so quantitation. The next step is amplification. So that's where we're going to make lots of copies of the pieces of DNA that we're interested in. Again, I said we're not sequencing your whole genome, we're just taking um, specific locations of the DNA, as I said, these ones that we scientists have found are different from person to person, but they don't cause any sort of diseases or they can't, can't tell if you wear glasses or not or anything like that. So we're just going to make copies of these specific pieces of DNA, and that's called amplification. We're amplifying it, making more of it. The next step is when we run it on our instrument, which is called a genetic analyzer. So we would take our DNA, we put it on the genetic analyzer, the samples run through it, and the data is collected it, um, by a laser, and it's just colored light is what the instrument sees. It sees colored light coming off at different times. But if I just look at that data, it's just colored light at different times, and a human can't really make anything out of it, so of course we need a software, a computer software, that can take that information and make it something that we can use in some way. The way that it does that is it what it comes off of, something that I would see is, um, I kind of say it looks kind of like a graph with a bunch of hills and uh, peaks and valleys, and we call that an electropharogram. And that is what we would look at to determine a DNA profile, because the software is going to compare the peaks and valleys and the different colors with knowns that um, come from the company to tell us if you see a if you see a blue peak at this time at this size this is going to be this um, this was what the number would be for that part of the profile if you see a red peak at this time it's going to be this number in the profile and that's how we end up making a table from our hills and valleys and making a table of what that person's profile is going to be Um, even if we don't know who it is, we know that that came from a person and that's their profile. And then we would do that with each item and compare them. And so if I can ask, you said before you, you had two known samples. Is that the same process that you put the two known samples through, the one for Crystal Soria and the one for Adam Montgomery? Exactly, yes. So from that you've developed or you were able to uh, see a table 
of what their DNA makeup was with regards to um, the the standards and the protocols that you would ordinarily follow in the lab. Again, like you said, we're not you know sequencing somebody's entire genome here. That's correct. And did you have a known sample for Harmony Montgomery? I did not. Okay. The one item you said before that you were able to come up, or not come up, but be able to discover and see um, that there was a profile there. Uh, do you remember what that item was? It was a toothbrush. Okay. And specifically, do you remember, did you uh, look at the toothbrush itself? Yes. Okay. I believe it was a troll's toothbrush. I recognize that to some degree, but mostly I can recognize the packaging um, because it has my initials and the date that I went into the bag <clears throat> on the t on the outside of the package. So I can see my initials and the date that I opened it the first time and the date I opened it a second time. So is this the Trolls toothbrush that you have? It is. I just cut some of the bristles off into my tube. Okay. And from that, did you put it through the same sequence that you just described for us? I did. Okay. And with regards to that particular um, profile that you were able to see from that toothbrush, um, what were you able to conclude after you were looking at that profile in comparison with your two known profiles of Crystal Sori and Adam Montgomery? So uh, remember we said half your DNA is from mom and half is from dad. So I could look at that profile as compared to both Crystal's and Adam's, and um, I could tell what part came from Crystal and what part came from Adam, and everything lined up perfectly as if that could have been from a child made by those two people. Okay. And specifically with regards to the child, could you tell what the gender of the child would be? It was female. At the time that you did this, did you know or not know that Crystal Sori has only had one biological child that's a female? I did not know that at the time. Okay. And with regards, did you know or did you not know that Crystal Sori only had one biological child with Adam Montgomery? I didn't know that either. With regards to making this comparison and being able to look at this, you stated before that you're able to come up with a probability or a certainty or what's the right term to use? Um, we are, we call, I, we call it a probability. Um, it's, or it's, we would say the words are, it's more likely. It's however times more likely that it came from two people than as if it didn't <coughs> come from those and it came from a random person. So are you able to, or the probability, what, what is the probability that there is some other female out there unrelated to a child of Crystal Sori and Adam Montgomery having a matching DNA for the DNA profile that you saw on that toothbrush? I feel like that's a statistic that maybe is possible, but I don't, didn't run that. So I know that the, the um, if I could look at, could I look at that last report that had the, the statistic? If you could, please, it? yes. And The June 29th report, June 29th, uh, 2022. And uh, with regards to uh, page 7280, excuse me, 7280, you're thinking about the second page of the report? Yes. So um, the statistic, once I looked at the profile of the toothbrush and compared it with both um, Crystal and Adam, it, the statistic was that it was at least 100 sextillion, so that's a lot of zeros. Um, I think 21, 18, 21 right. something like that. Um, time, I would have to write that down. Um, more likely to see these genetic results if the profile was, of the toothbrush was a biological child of Adam Montgomery and Crystal Sori than if it was two unrelated people. So it's that much more likely that it's from a biological child of Adam Montgomery and Crystal Sori than... Than some random people. Than random yes. people. 
And that's uh, 100 sextillion? Yes. So practically speaking, uh, from looking at this, without being able to say, of course, that this is, in fact, Harmony Montgomery's profile, uh, it's 100 sextillion more likely her profile than anybody else. Right. Okay. If, that, if, if they have one child and or one female child, then that would be my next step in a, saying that that makes sense, right? If they had one female if child. If they had one female child, right. yes. Which you didn't know at the time that you did this testing, right? Correct. All right. Your Honor, if we can approach. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to break for the day. Uh, we'll resume tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., so please be here at 8.45. I'm just going to ask you, ma'am, to stay seated. Um, I remind you, don't discuss the case with each other or with anybody else. Don't do any independent research. Don't <coughs> look up any law or terms that you've heard. Don't do any scientific research. Um, your verdict must be based exclusively on the evidence that you hear uh, at this trial, not on some, something else that you've heard or read um, or uh, based on any conversations with you that you've had with anybody else. So uh, it is your highest duty as officers of this court to make sure that you are following that obligation. Uh, please come back tomorrow morning at 8.45 for a 9 a.m. start. Thank you very much for your time and attention today, ladies and gentlemen. Please all rise for the jurors. Step down. Um, just be, please be very careful of those wires. Okay. okay? Yeah, the, uh, carrier reports. The, the, oh. the reports. Thank you, Ms. Wayne. You're welcome. All right, Council. Um, be here at 8:45 for a 9 a.m. start. If for any reason you need to see me, uh, please let me know earlier. I have something at 8:30, but I would move it if I if if you needed to see me early for some reason. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.